for doing it. Murder. A year of education.
Deinonychus lived in the early Cretaceous period, after Allosaurus and before Tyrannosaurus Rex. One of the most fearsome hunters wasn't big at all. He measured close to ten feet long and only five feet tall. Deinonychus, with oh. his powerful jaw. Deinonychus, oh. with his terrible claws. I actually really like this song. With his powerful song here, Dinonicus. With his terrible This song slides. His arms were long to hold, his prey sharp claws were used to grip. But the deadly claw was on his foot, the one he used to rip. Dinonicus. With his powerful jaw, Deinonychus, with his terrible claws. Dinonychus, he wasn't a big dinosaur, dinosaur but will ah! the sound to say, ah! I must defend the very ah! fierce ah! hunter of the soul. Deinonychus, ah! with his powerful jaw, Deinonychus, Well, hello, hello, everybody, and welcome back to Paleontologizing. I'm glad you're here. We're going to have a fun stream. Happy Tuesday to you. If it is Tuesday where you are, if it's not, happy whatever day it is, whether you're watching in a time zone different from my own, or whether you're watching sometime in the future in a VOD or on YouTube, I'm glad you could be here today. For those of you who, uh might be new and an extra special welcome to you and that includes Rob Arts there and the other cool new people who showed up let me introduce myself real quick my name is Danny Anduza I'm a dinosaur paleontologist as you could probably guess looking at my office here I work on dinosaurs I study dinosaurs I publish on them in the scientific literature I talk about dinosaurs five days a week here on Twitch. During the summers, I stream from the field, digging up dinosaurs. This past summer, I was working in Wyoming and Utah, digging up at least three new species of dinosaur with some other really cool people, and we were broadcasting that live. So if that sounds interesting to you, check out the YouTube page. All of those VODs are up on YouTube. Thanks to uh, Claire Burr for putting all those up there. Thank you, Claire. Anyway, normally though, when I'm not in the field, I'm streaming from here in my office. We go over some of the latest fossil news, talk about new discoveries in paleontology, and we do a lot, a lot of Q&A. Answering your questions, because everybody's got questions about fossil science, about the history of life on our incredible planet Earth, and our place in that history, and on that planet. So, anyway. Yeah, dinosaurs are what I study, what I publish on. That's my wheelhouse. But if you've got questions about broader topics in natural history, I'll do my best to answer those too. That's what these streams are all about. Now let's go through chat real quick and we'll say hello to everybody. Uh, I started on time today, which I'm proud of myself for. Not a minute late. You know, these things take a while to put together, so. Glad we got that going. Kodali, thank you for suggesting people nominate me for the Streamer Awards. It's, you know, we showed up in the Streamer Awards. I can't show you the clip, unfortunately, because it's not exactly G-rated, but I showed up in the Streamer Awards last year, really briefly. I think it was because people from this community nominated this channel, and I appreciate that. Anyway, Kodali, it's good to see you. Matt M33, what's shaking with you? Howdy, howdy. Science Streams. Hello to you. I'm excited for our crossover tomorrow. I gotta find some interesting papers, Science Streams. I gotta find some. Um, I don't know if there's any super new ones. We might do an older paper. We'll see. 
Um, Tommy Platicus, how are you doing? Howdy, howdy, little pink pony. What's shaken? Baja Smancer. Hello, hello to you, Lilith Hobo. Araya Thallium, Steely Dan, Fall Machine. Grim Deviant, Trek Nerd, Hugin, and Neilf. Tony is my baby. The Big TN. And Soak Film. Soak, thank you for that raid. I really appreciate it. I don't know why an alert didn't come up for that, but I appreciate you, Soak Films. Thank you so much. How did your stream go? I hope it was excellent. Uh, we've got the Dinosaur Dave. Howdy, howdy, Dinosaur Dave. We've got the Good Morty, Hazemaker, and Rob Arts. New folks who presumably came in with Soak Films. Welcome, welcome. It's good to have you here. Uh, and the biologist was working on moths and or butterflies earlier today. That sounds like a great day, and the biologist. My day's been good, too. I got to go to the zoo this morning. I got closer to a jaguar than I have ever been in my life. And uh, I'll show you a, some photographic evidence. A live jaguar. Check that out. Yeah, that was just this morning. Uh, at the Oakland Zoo. There's actually two jaguars. You can only really see one of them. One of the most singular specimens I've encountered in all my distinguished career. But enough about my work. What did you want to show me, Lisa? And, uh, Hubble Rectum, how are you doing? Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Um, and Media, thank you for the raid, too. I appreciate that. And how did your stream go? I hope it was excellent. Lunaseer, it's good to see you, too. And Fall Machine misplaced your placenta sometime last week. I'm impressed you kept it for that long, Fall Machine. It kind of serves its purpose, and then it, it becomes not as useful anymore, so... But yeah, yeah. Uh... Not the brain? Hello, hello to you. Otter, do it. Welcome, Otter. It's good to see you here. Don't go into the cornfield. There you go, Otter, yeah. Um, I hope you enjoyed the uh, the cold open video, for those of you who are new. And those of you who aren't new, I hope you enjoyed it even more. Because it's not the first time you've seen it. Niffler, how are you doing? Howdy, howdy. Lavi and Avi, welcome back to you. It's great to see you again. I hope all is well. Golganek, did I greet you yet, Golganek? Golganek, wonderful Golganek. Golganek, thank you for being here, as always. I appreciate you very much. Always put a smile on my face in you here, Golganek. Thank you. Phoenix the Archaeologist, how are you doing? I hope you're having a great day. Omar Luna, hello and good afternoon to you too. I hope you're doing well. Joe3E says, hello, Mr. Anduza, mods and chat. Please, Joe3E, Mr. Anduza is my father's name. Call me Danny. It's good to have you here. Uh, and that was the Godfather Waltz earlier, Madam 33. Yeah. Um, six 69 how are you doing? Hello, hello. Henrida, good morning to you too. It's afternoon here, but a good morning to you, Henrida. I hope you're having a good day. Mr. Knight, the IT guy. Hello, hello to you. Thanks for the thumbs up. And I love moths too, S.V. Harkin. They're pretty cool. And uh, sometimes they star in movies. Can anybody think of a movie starring a moth? I can think of at least a few. Hmm. Matt M33, I did not take the brush to the zoo. But I did take binoculars. I always take binoculars to the zoo. I didn't need them in this case. It was pretty close. But, uh... Yeah. Yeah. I don't I don't know why more people don't take binoculars to the zoo. Usually you can't get close enough to the animals to, like, really... You know, big... Modern zoos are good because they have bigger enclosures. The animals have more space. They can hide more easily if they feel like it. That makes them more comfortable. And I think a way to make that more enjoyable as a zoo patron is to bring binoculars so you can see the animals up close. You know? Yeah. And, uh... A pimp cat... No, not Jet Jaguar. 
The film I was thinking of was another Toho film, Mothra. Or Godzilla vs. Mothra. Or, uh... Godzilla, Mothra, and King Ghidorah, Giant Monsters All Out Attack. There's a bunch of different films that feature Mothra. Well, I would argue it's probably the, the most well-known cinema moth. Although Mothra might actually be a butterfly. You know what? And the biologist could probably tell us. I don't think there is a, a straight cladogenetic divide between moths and butterflies. I think they're probably... Yeah, I don't know. I don't think those are distinct clades. There is not. See? Yes, and the biologist. Excellent. That's what I thought. Moths and butterflies. Yeah. Moths are ugly butterflies. Oh no, misadventures in Astro. Don't say that. Sometimes they're gorgeous. Um. Yeah. I mean, look at that one. The prettiest moth. Also, to my knowledge, the largest. Um. Yeah. Really spectacular. Spared no expense. And Golgonek, thank you for gifting and the biologist. I really do appreciate that, Golgonek. I do. It's funny. Uh, the TTS gal says Annie, the biologist. But I read that as Ann. Is that right? Is it Ann or is it Annie? And the biologist. Let me know. Yeah. Um. But yeah, moths do have a beauty of their own. It's true, Neil. Here, can we find a video talking about moths and butterflies just to kind of start us off here? I like how sometimes the search suggestions on YouTube are like, it's what you're searching for, plus somebody typed in video. It's like, you're on YouTube. <laughs> what do you expect to find here? <laughs> uh, yeah. Here, let's... Let's take a look at this, perhaps? Hello, I've traveled Hello. to the Lower Derwent Valley National Nature Reserve to encounter some of its mysterious nocturnal inhabitants, moths. However, because I'm pretty impatient... Oh, you're Dutch, so it's pronounced differently. Really Interesting, and okay. I'm going to bring the moths to me using the power of light. Sneaky. Oh. This is a moth trap. A giant plastic box with Whoa. a bulb on top. Cool. Let's see what happens when we leave it on and wait for it to get dark. Uh oh. Moths. It's hairy, yes. Going to see some moths. There in the dark. Here come the moths. As you can see, there are plenty of moths fluttering around, like butterflies of the night, which raises an important question about these creatures. Just what is the difference between a moth? and a butterfly at the adult stage. Hmm. Let's find out. Yeah, let's do it. Trend cases. It's, it's a dinosaur. Uh -huh. Oh, Hazemaker, thank you for the follow and welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Howdy, howdy. Trend cases spent most of my life terrified of moths. We used to get some big ones here in Ireland. Uh, seems to be more rare these last 20 years, though. That's kind of unfortunate. I mean, shoot. You know, some moths do get very, very large. Um, yeah. You know, like, they're, and their larvae can cause a lot of destruction in, uh, in downtown Tokyo. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, they are, you know, they're positive creatures. They, you know, they generally fight for truth and justice. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. Moths are good. I like them. Uh, and light pollution might be taking a toll on the population. That, and pesticides, and 
loss of habitat, and all kinds of stuff. Like, I'm sure moths are probably being hit on all sides. Which is unfortunate. Yeah. Um. But yeah, but there is a giant Aussie moth? What is this, Dinosaur Dave? Look at that! Oh, cool. Very cool. Man, the image stabilization is making this look like it was shot underwater, though. That's weird. Yeah. Very cool. Not quite Mothra-sized, but pretty big. Pretty big. Well, let's figure out what is the difference between a moth and a butterfly, because I don't actually know. The short answer is that... I, I'm pretty sure the short answer is there isn't really a difference. Like, they're not separate clades. Uh, it's kind of arbitrary what gets called a moth and what gets called a butterfly. It's not like they had a split at the base of the family tree and then this clade is butterflies and this clade is moths. I think they're all within Lepidoptera, right? But yeah. That there isn't one. Moths and butterflies are both part of the order Lepidoptera. There you go. Okay. is largely a subjective one. Okay. Well, that answers that question. Time for some Jaffa Cakes. Okay. Cool. Now let's continue. Night. What's a Jaffa cake, though? Ow. Uh, Loud. <laughs> a little bit embarrassing. David says we need to do the long answer to the question as well. And as he's the boss... The difference is the names. There you go. Yeah. The first thing I should say is that you can't make any conclusion as to whether it's a moth or a butterfly based on whether it's flying by day or at night. Hmm. In the UK, okay. there are more species of day-flying moth than there are species of butterfly. Interesting. Butterflies, such as red well, hang on. We didn't actually get to see... 2,500 UK moth species. ...day-flying moth than there are species... ...and only 59 UK butterfly species. There's more moths. There's at least three more of them. As you can see with these figures. ...is a butterfly. Some butterflies, such as red admirals, can even migrate at night. We have those here, also can't in California. Color. Moths are often thought to be small, brown, and boring. And here are a few clips of my favourite boring, Ooh. brown moths. So, <laughs> cool. what does that leave us with? Wings. Specifically, the wing resting position. Generally, huh. butterflies rest with wings out flat or closed above them. Oh. Theirs over their back, like a tent. Interesting. Yeah, I'm sure there are exceptions. There's also uh, fire skippers. I don't know if they're moths, considered moths or butterflies or what, but they hold their wings in like an unusual way also. Yeah. And one of the most obvious are the skipper butterflies. Yeah, it's skippers. A halfway house between butterflies and moths. Next, look at the body size. Huh. Generally, butterflies have thin, dainty bodies compared with the chunkier, sometimes hairier bodies oh, of moths. Oh, interesting. Bodies of moths can sometimes verge on resembling a small mammal. Also, take a <laughs> close look at the antennae. Or a large mammal if you're in the Cretaceous period. <laughs> or especially the Jurassic. Uh. European butterflies have clubbed antennae, which end in a blob. Technical term there. Moths a blob. have thin antennae, tapering to a point, or, in the case of males... They've got feathers. Antennae. Yeah. The feathering increases the surface area for detecting pheromones. Only the... So that's a sexually dimorphic thing, where only the males have got the feathers on the antennae? Feathers on the antennae? Very, very cool. That's really neat. That's super neat. Very cool. And that's very cool. Chemical signals from the females that broadcast a message of Oi, over here, stupid. As usual, there are <laughs> exceptions. With the most Moths are famously rude to to their con specifics. Uh yeah. Oi, over here, stupid. As usual, there are exceptions. <laughs> with the most obvious one being the day flying burnet moths. Cool. Uh, and the biologist says, my university is doing a lot of research on the sexual communication of moths. Very interesting. Huh. Very interesting. That's not really something that we have in the uh, vertebrate world, I think. It's like a sensory structure that is sexually dimorphic like that. Like, that's really, really interesting. There, I can't think of one, at least. 
so it's it's really interesting that the males would be the ones that have this extra sensory apparatus for detecting pheromones from females. Um, pretty cool. Finally, a key difference is one you'll never see unless you dissect your specimen, which we don't recommend as they tend not to enjoy it. Yeah. In most moths, the hind wings are joined to the forewings by a hook-like structure called a frenulum. Huh. Butterflies don't have this. Apart from one exception, a skipper in Australia. So, in conclusion, if you can't decide where it's a butterfly or a moth, look at the wings, the body size and hairiness, and the antennae, and that should help you reach a conclusion. Mm. Well, that was the short and long answer to the issue of moths versus butterflies. But regardless of how we classify them, moths don't care. They just carry on being incredible. That's all from me and my mothy friends. Until next time. My mothy friends. Um, good stuff. Here is a link to that video in the chat for you. Yeah. And there you go, Trend K. Yeah. That's, that's kind of a generic anatomical term. So it's not just what you think it is. It, there's other creature, creatures with other parts of their bodies that have that. So yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, moths and their antennae. <laughs> Steely Dan, yeah. Moths. Uh, and guess the dinosaur? You know, let's let's do it, Dinosaur Dave. Yeah. Um, hang on a sec. Um, let's take a look at this one. Oh boy, what is wrong with this Spinosaur? Ugh, it looks like somebody left it out in the sun, and then they left it in their pocket, and it went through the wash and through the dryer. Oof. Oof. Ugh. In the... In the... Is this supposed to be a Spinosaur? Because that is not at all what their, their dorsal spines look like. Those are... Here it almost looks like it's on a sailfish or something like that. You know? Yeah. It's from 2011? I mean... Still, that's 10 years after Jurassic Park 3's Spinosaurus, which looked really good for the time. Yeah. Oof. Well, looking at the cars there, I don't see any large, obnoxious SUVs in the background. This might be from the UK or from Europe or something. I don't, know. I don't know what kind of tree that is there. I don't know where this is supposed to be set, but it doesn't look like it's supposed to be from the U.S. I don't know. Uh. But yeah, yeah. German cars. Yeah, I see a Volkswagen there, but that also looks like a Chevrolet there in the white. This looks like a like a Chevrolet or whatever company General Motors produces their cars under, whatever badge they produce it under in, in Europe. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, oof. I don't like this. I don't like it. What's wrong with the tail? Uh. <laughs> Store brand Spinosaur. Um, so Spinosaurus... Uh, the neural spines on Spinosaurus are actually really robust. They are... They're, they're wide like this. Almost like you'd see on, I don't know, a bison or something like that. As opposed to Dimetrodon, where those are really, really thin and spindly. And likely supported a a very thin sail, very narrow from side to side. In Spinosaurus, they're chonky. I mean, these are robust. They're, they have significant mass to them. Uh, a lot like on a bison. 
Yeah, and there you go. We have one at home. Exactly, animal biologist. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I wish.com is fun. It's like Lenina, yeah. Um. Yeah, so with this, it. Uh, I don't know. It just really kind of irks me. It's like a. It's a fundamental misunderstanding of, of how this animal works. When you just have these, like, little. You know, super pointy spines like a Dimetrodon or something. Um, they're not like that. They're, these were thick. And I think these all would have been wrapped in muscle and tendon. This idea of Spinosaurus having a, like a thin sail on its back, I think is completely wrong. Um, I think it would have been more of a fleshy hump. Honestly. But yeah. Will those spines have any movement? I mean, that's kind of why they evolved is to not allow for that. This is a way to kind of stiffen the back. And and hold up the front of the animal. Um, it's kind of like uh, yeah, like the skeleton of an animal that I saw today, a bison. So we don't think of bison as having a sail, you know. They just have a big fleshy hump. This is bison antiquus, which. It's more robust and more, um, not more robust, but more pronounced in this animal. It's got a taller hump because it's a bigger animal. And it's got a bigger, heavier head than bison bison, the extant American bison. Um, but, oh, that's lovely. That is lovely right there. This demonstrates what I'm trying to show you. So it's not a sail. It's like a big fleshy hump. And the bigger you are... The heavier you are, and the longer neural spines you need, and the thicker neural spines you need. And so, that's what I think is going on with Spinosaurus. I'm not convinced that it's a sail at all. Yeah. And which group is the bison in the tree? It's a, it's an artiodactyl, so a, uh, an even-toed ungulate, hoofed mammal. But they're closely related to cows. Bison and domestic cattle can actually interbreed. So yeah, yeah. Hey Tannerim, how you doing? Welcome, welcome. Yeah. And the point is to take a deep dive into what is right and wrong about what it's shown, so you can guess what it is. That's it. Well, yeah, dinosaur day. But I'm I'm using this for my own purposes too. We're like, we're we're discussing dinosaur anatomy because of this. Oh so yeah, yeah. Uh, I appreciate you, dinosaur day. I appreciate you putting all this together. Um, but it might take me a while to get through them. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, Salamander says, in your opinion, which media reconstruction of Spinosaurus is the greater affront? Semi JP adjacent one in the La Brea show last week. I'm not familiar with that. Salamander. Uh, amazing Dino World, not. Yeah, I don't, I've not seen either of those, Salamander. Yeah. But yeah. Um, well, let's let's look. Um, La Brea Spinosaurus. Oh boy. Uh, I don't know if we actually get a good look at it. Did we? Is it from that show, La Brea? I've heard bad things about it. Um. Yeah. Let's try Amazing Dino World Spinosaurus. Oh, this is pretty good. I mean, I don't... I don't suspect... They actually did walk on their knuckles. Now you got me talking about Spinosaurids. I try not to talk about Spinosaurids. It's a Spinosaurus. A 15 meter long, huge carnivore. Yeah. Out into the sea. Oh boy. So we don't have any actual evidence that they walked on their knuckles. 
Um, yeah, and this is not possible here. Spinosaurus would not have been capable of swimming under the water like a submarine like this. For a number of different reasons, just the first among them being it was too buoyant. Like, dinosaurs like this would have had tremendous difficulty diving under the water because they've got this kind of bird-like architecture. Especially theropod dinosaurs. They would have been good at swimming, but not good at diving. Um... Also, given that it's got this big, tall thing on its back, those elongate neural spines, that would make it unstable in the water uh, in terms of, I guess, what you would call roll in, like, uh, aviation. You've got pitch, you've got yaw, and you've got roll. So in terms of roll, it would just whoop, go, like, on its side and then kind of go up to the surface like this. So they, they could not do this. Yeah. They should have stayed on land. <laughs> oh boy. Anyway, um, yeah. So yeah, yeah. And Harry says, what is the function of a sail? Uh, in the case of animals that do have what we call H-E-L-S, hyper elongate or H-E-N-S, hyper elongate neural spines. Um, like, for instance, uh, a basilisk lizard. It seems to be mostly for display. So these guys actually do have a sail of sorts, where it actually is elongate neural spines, covered mostly just by skin. They don't really have you know, big thick muscles attached there or anything. It seems to be a display sort of thing. Plumed basilisk. There we go. Description. Let's see. Males have three crests, one on the head, one on the back, and one on the tail, while females only have the head crest. So there's a male, and he's got all three of those. He's got the sail on his back. Females do not have that. So there's a female. So that tells us that this is almost certainly for sexual display. And presumably that wouldn't show up in this... Would it show up in the skeleton? I guess it probably would. Let's take a look. Um... Yeah, it does. That's really interesting. And in that the males actually have those neural spines. That's that's bone there. Those are really elongate. And the females don't have that. Um, I suppose it's possible that this is the same as in Spinosaurus. But I think it's very unlikely. Dinosaurs... Uh, it doesn't seem like they have a lot of sexual dimorphism in their skeleton. The males and female skeletons are going to be pretty much identical to each other. That's been the case any time this has been studied in depth in dinosaurs. We've been completely unable to tell the difference between them just based on their skeletal morphology. The difference between males and females. How they would have differed is in their... maybe a little bit in size. Oh. Aren't you the man who told me to live every week like it's Shark Week? Crazy nut. Nothing's impossible except for dinosaurs. Don't give up on life, sir. <laughs> wow. Crazy nut, 27 months. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the support, Crazy Nut. I really do. Thank you, thank you. It's a long time. Holy cow, 27 months. Yeah. Um, and Luna Seer says, is for sexual display the anatomical version of probably a toy religious object you get from archaeology? It, unfortunately, it kind of is the equivalent in paleontology, and it shouldn't be. Because if, if different anatomical structures are for sexual display, that usually implies they have to be sexually dimorphic, and that's usually not the case. So, like, uh... 
The horns and frills of Ceratopsian dinosaurs are a good example. Um... Yeah. Here, I'm trying to find you when Kevin Padian was talking about this in a talk. Um, let's get to the dinosaurs part. Here we go. That's informed what a lot of paleontologists quickly because I know you're not paleontologists, but I know everybody likes dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> right? And I want to show you how the current condition of literature in the neontological world has informed what a lot of paleontologists today are thinking about when they're trying to interpret the structures of, of these things. Um, in general, for old dead critters, when you're trying to figure out what a bizarre structure I know, right, Harry? Yeah. <laughs> and so neontological was what was what he said there. And I want to show you how the current condition of literature in the neontological world has So neontological, that's like you know, modern. Um yeah. Neontological. It's part of biology that, in contrast to paleontology, deals with living or more generally recent organisms. It's the study of extant taxa. That is neontology. So, basically, after we had paleontology, it's like, well, shoot, what do we call everything else? Uh, neontology. But this got auto-captioned as neon falafel world. <laughs> Which sounds like... Uh... Yeah, sounds like a lighthearted establishment maybe in the in one of the Blade Runner films. Oh, Neon Falafel World. You a Blade Runner. Yeah. Uh or in Dubai, Harry, yeah, that works too. Um Yeah. How the current condition of literature in the neon philosophical world has informed what a lot of paleontologists today are thinking about when they're trying to interpret the structures of, of these things. Um in general, for old dead critters, when you're trying to figure out what a bizarre structure is, was, or, and yep. it's not a member of a clearly living group, like we're pretty sure we know what, you know, extinct antelope horns, that's okay. But when you're talking about a critter like this, I mean, whoa, the sky's the limit. And it has been in terms of, of producing um, hypotheses. Generally speaking, traditionally paleontologists have gone first for mechanical um, explanations, things that yep. bear on some kind of function, and they've tried to test it to some degree or another. If those mechanical um, explanations don't seem to work very well, or if they don't even bother, they just say it's for display. Well, there's lots of different kinds of display here yep. that often are not um, very well uh, dissected in the literature. These all must be for display. Okay, that's a starting point, but you know. Very, can... very practical animals, misadventures in Astro. <laughs> That's the thing, is that, like, it's kind of the opposite, actually. It seems like dinosaurs evolved all kinds of crazy features that didn't really have any particular fun function except to show off. But showing off may have been a, a very, very important function in itself. Um, but Kevin Payton here is just saying that this is the explanation that paleontologists have tried to go for first, and then if that doesn't work, you move on to display. Can we test hypotheses beyond this? Well... Um, many of you know about Dave Weiss samples. Um, um, there you go, I'm fighting Mothra, yeah. Studies of Parasaurolophus, which is a, um, a duck-billed dinosaur, a crest Yeah. Dinosaur. Can we get some Parasaurolophus in the chat going? And here's, the blue is the nasal passage. He breathes up here. It yep. goes back down like this. There's a diverticulum here. And then it goes back down into the into the lungs from, from this direction. There were myriad there you go, Mama Coon, yeah. hypotheses proposed over the years. And Hugan, what question was that? I don't remember. Could have been used for. Yeah. And I'm giving you just Sorry, you weren't feeling well. <laughs> Dave's first approach was to see whether these were testable. Because if it's not testable, it may be interesting, but we can't, you know, we can't do anything about it. Um, 
There are many and and did dinosaurs get sprained ankles? Dinosaur ankles work differently from ours. They're more of a hinge. Our ankles are a little bit more like complicated and weird and dare I say not as well designed. Uh, as like dinosaur ankles. Di I mean, dinosaurs have the same ankles as birds because that's where birds got it from. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Can birds sprain their ankles? I wonder. I'm not sure. I'm sorry you sprained your ankle there, Doom Guy. That's no fun. Yeah. Shoot. That's why you had problems with it. But the cool thing he did was to take a bunch of PVC tubing of the same size as this and build what he called a hadrophone. Yep. He, like, made a We've seen clips of good. this. <laughs> and, and it actually made, um, it resonated at particular frequencies. Um, and I've given them to you here. That's kind of, um, um, sort of a chord. It's not talking about but, knees. Uh, and, oh, yeah, knees. Sure. Don't get me started on yeah, knees. Right? So yeah, you, you won't do this. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then he said, well, this isn't enough. He checked the size of the stapes, which tells you the frequencies that they can hear, and they matched. So that's good. And recently, yep. um, Sarah Werning and Andy Farkey and some other good other people <clears throat> found a baby. Uh, yep. That's Joe, the baby Parasaurolophus. We looked at that, what, last week? Yeah. Oh, and Hugin, we'll get to that after this, yeah. Compsognathus and Procompsognathus? Yeah. But he can still hear what the adults are capable of producing. So, I don't know what that means, but at least it shows it's not inconsistent with the general hypothesis. But the problem we get is, when we move to related animals, what happens? And here's where the advent of phylogenetics really helps us to put a control, some kind of control on our hypotheses about what old dead things were doing. These guys are all related, but they have completely different crests that would not have functioned in the way that the crest of Parasolophus was suggested by Y sample to function. Um, what if you what if you look at Triceratops? Here's Andy Farkey. So he took some of these um, um, toy dinosaurs from the British Museum and just said, well, if they play so a lot, where's the places where they're going to get their heads most beat up? And so he grabbed those on the bones, this is where he expected to find them. Then he went to real skulls in the museum and said, does it correlate with this? Turns out not very well. Hmm. Not very well. What he didn't ask is whether some skulls had a lot of it and some skulls didn't, because maybe you'd have a male-female difference there. But you know what? We can't yeah. tell the males from the females in these sequences. Um, the great variety of the horns and frills, most of which, by the way, in almost all animals except Triceratops over here, are actually open. So if you think this evolved for use as a shield, you'd be mistaken. Triceratops is the end member in time and phylogeny of its group. And for most of its existence, um, genetically, it doesn't have an open frill. So you can't yep. transfer, even if you think Sir Lancelot was what they're doing, you can't transplant. I mean... Unless you think, like, I think Kevin was alluding to that there. Given that this is from 2014, he would know about the, like, Trichotoro hypothesis. And I think that's why he said during most of its ontogenetic stages. But yeah. Displacer. Holy cow, Displacer. Look at all those chickens. Thank you for the six months of support, Displacer. I really appreciate that. And that brings us to our next topic of discussion. Hugin was asking about this. Compsognathus versus Procompsognathus. What's the deal there? That was, of course, a, a clip from the Lost World Jurassic Park, the sequel to the original 1993 Jurassic Park film. And uh, those dinosaurs in there, in the movie, they're called Compsognathus. And they look like this in the movie. Um, that's not what Compsognathus would have looked, looked like in real life. They had more than two fingers. For whatever reason, they just gave them two fingers in this. Um, or did they up it to three later? Anyway. These only appear in The Lost World Jurassic Park and briefly in Jurassic Park 3, and then probably in the Jurassic World movies, but nuts to those. Um, 
when I was a kid, Compsognathus was one of the smallest dinosaurs we had. And for a while, when I was when I was really little, it was it was my very favorite dinosaur. Very fond of little Compsognathus. Um, I really liked them in uh, in the movie The Lost World too. The thing is, there's another dinosaur that kind of fills the same role in the Jurassic Park novel from 1990, I think, published. And it's Procompsognathus in that. Procompsognathus is a different dinosaur. Dismodus. My life down twenty. Uh, thank you, thank you, Dismodus, for the twenty months of support. Twenty months. Ah, ah, ah. Thank you for that, Dismodus. Earnestly, thank you for keeping me online for that long. I really appreciate it. Uh, um, Procompsognathus. I think is kind of a mysterious dinosaur. We don't really know what it was like. I believe it's from the Triassic period of Europe. Um, I think it's from Germany. And it might be a Coelophysoid. It might be related to Podokosaurus. It might be... I don't think we really know. Procompsognathus. Yep, Coelophysid theropod dinosaur. So it's related to Coelophysis. Uh, that could grow up to one meter or 3.3 feet long. We do not know that. We don't know that. We don't know how big it could get, because I don't think we know that this thing is ontogenetically mature. We don't know if it's full grown. But yeah. Uh, there we go. Mm -hmm. The fragmentary and poorly preserved skeleton of Procompsognathus was found in Germany in 1909. There we go. Uh, 1921, Von Huyen referred two more specimens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're not... I don't think we really know that those referred specimens are actually the same critter. We don't really know if it's the... You know, if that animal's even mature. We know that other coelophysids definitely got bigger than this. So that could very well be a juvenile. Yeah. And there we go. Compsognathus in pop culture. Oh, boy. Bro, Compsognathus appears in the novel Jurassic Park, just like I was telling you. And in its sequel, The Lost World, by Michael Crichton. The species is sometimes referred to as compies by the characters. Um, well, the author invents a venomous bite for Procompsognathus with soporific effects. There's no evidence to support venom in Procompsognathus, yes. And I think... Maybe... Um, maybe Jack Horner told Steven Spielberg to change the name of the dinosaur to Compsognathus because we actually had better material from Compsognathus. Again, this is all that we really have from Procompsognathus. It's the holotype specimen. The referred specimens might be a different animal. Whereas for Compsognathus, we've got slightly better material. Actually, much better material. Yeah. Compsognathus, the elegant jaw... It is beautiful. It's really nice. Um, but it's not mature. Like, this is this is not a mature individual. So we don't know what the adults would look like. This could even be a juvenile of, like, a Carcharodontosaur or something, potentially. It's possible. Um, are any of these available for 3D printing? Oh, boy. Sixty dollars. Shoot. Well, I could print one like that, I suppose. Um, a little 
little pricey. That's definitely less expensive. Yeah, maybe I'll print one of these. Bids can make a wonderful difference in promoting the appreciation Delta Rain. and understanding of fossil science here on Twitch. Thank you, thank you, Delta. God. Holy cow. Do I appreciate that? 1,000 bits. Appreciate that very much, Delta. Thank you, thank you for the support. Holy cow. How are you doing, Delta? I hope, uh, I hope things are going well. It's good to see you. Yeah. Um, and Slappy, this is the old Dilophosaurus idea. Um, it'd be cool to do a, an updated one, but... Yeah. Yeah. It's not really on my agenda right now. It'd be cool to do that in the future. Delta Rain says, thanks for your work with science popularizing and education. It's super important. Delta, thank you. I really appreciate that. Holy cow. Um... Thank you, thank you, Delta. <laughs> Again, I hope you're doing well. It's great to see you, as always. Um, but yeah. Caterpiggle said, Do dinosaurs look very different when young versus adult? Yes. Caterpiggle, we talk about this a lot on this channel. Um, about dinosaur ontogeny. The changes that a dinosaur undergoes... Ontogeny. Between when it's very small... And juvenile, and then when it grows up, it changes tremendously. There used to be like Ontogeny. over 20 named species of Triceratops. You know, Triceratops hordus and Prorsus and Eurycephalus and Hatcheri and uh, all these other Triceratops species. So many of them, and it turns out that most of them are just different growth stages Ontogeny. of the same, same species. So again, that is... Ontogeny. Ontogeny. Um, it turns out a lot of dinosaurs changed tremendously through ontogeny, to the point where we we thought that the juveniles, juveniles and adults were different species or different genera, sometimes different families altogether. Nope. Turns out they just change a lot. Um, so yeah, yeah. Uh, so it could be that Compsognathus is just a juvenile of a larger meat-eating dinosaur. A Cacarodontosaur or something like that. Um, some sort of Allosauroid. It's, it's possible. Uh, but yeah, there is something weird with the depiction of Compsognathus and Procompsognathus in the Jurassic Park series. Um, let's see here. I'm trying to find you a clip. Um, Trying to find you the clip with the Bob Bakker stand in. This is so difficult to find. Shoot. There we go. This is what I was looking for. Um, there we go. So that's supposed to be Compsognathus in this. Do you hear what he said? And so 
this is clearly supposed to be Procompsignathus. Because he used the species name for Procompsignathus. Procompsignathus triassicus. Not, what is it, Compsignathus longipes, I think? Um, let's see... All right, Compsignatha day. Compsignathus. The type species. Compsignathus. Longipes. Versus Procompsignathus triassicus. Procompsignathus triassicus. So it's weird. They're like, they're kind of trying to do an amalgam of two different dinosaurs in it. And it's confusing. Those two dinosaurs are, they are different from one another, but they're not the most different. They're, uh, so yeah, it just gets a little confusing and weird. But yeah, yeah. Anyway, did you have any more specific question than that, Hugin? Because... If there's a particular aspect about it that you're curious, uh, I can try and tackle it, but... Yeah, it is confusing what they're trying to do there. It's like they're they're creating a composite of two dinosaurs and kind of hoping that nobody notices. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And Velky Den, yeah, new office. This was, uh... Over a month ago that I moved in here. Yeah. Um, welcome back, Velky. It's good to have you here. Yeah. And let's see. The series is calling them Velocir- Yeah, well, there you go, I'm a left, yeah. Yeah. That, at least, there's a... You know, an obvious through line. Where it's because of Greg Powell's book, uh predatory dinosaurs of the world that Deinonychus gets called Velociraptor in the Jurassic Park books and in the Jurassic Park movies. With Compsognathus versus Procompsognathus, it, uh... I don't know. It's much less clear what the story is. Yeah. And Wood says that office feels cozy? Thanks, Wood. Yeah, it is, I would say. Yeah. Um... But yeah, and Hugin says, so are they completely anatomically different? It drifts how close are they? They're not particularly close. Um, so... Procompsognathus is a coelophysid, or a coelophysoid. So it's related to coelophysis, we think. Um, but we don't know exactly what it looked like. Yeah, there's a depiction of Procompsignathus there by Timothy Bradley. Excellent art there. Yeah, Procompsignathus as a Coelophysis relative versus Compsignathus, which is considered a Compsignathid. Um, here's one making it look like Sinoceropteryx. Oh, yeah. But who really knows what these animals would look like when they were mature? There's a nice depiction of Compsignathus there, too, by Christopher Du Piazza. Yeah. Um, if anything, Compsignathus is more advanced than Procompsignathus, as the names would imply. Um... It's from later in time. It's more derived. It's going to be possibly more bird-like. Uh, it's maybe more likely to be covered in feathers. If Compsignathus is indeed a close relative of Sinoceropteryx, as we suspect it probably is, if it's mature, I don't know, then uh, 
Yeah, but I don't know. There's a lot of question marks. There's a lot of question marks. Yeah. Does that make sense, Hugo? And you don't have that book? Nice, Dinosaur Dave. Yeah. Yeah. And MLF says, needs more fossils? I'm working on it. I was working on, uh, not just 3D printing, but smoothing and sealing and sanding and painting uh, some new specimens for him. There's one of them. The Cleveland Skull. This was the holotype of Nano Tyrannus. Most dinosaur paleontologists consider this to be a, a juvenile Tyrannosaurus. But, uh... Yeah. But there's a few people who think that Nano Tyrannus is a distinct animal. Um, I'm not one of them, but we don't know for sure, you know? I'm still working on painting that. I've got a baby Myasaura. Uh, I'll show you that, actually. Hang on. Baby Myasaura right here. Uh, not yet painted, but you can see all the water putty filling in some of those seams and stuff. And then the smoothing compound helped get rid of the print lines and all of that, so I will be painting this soon. Now, when you've got to stream every day like I do, every weekday, it's kind of hard to find time to, to do stuff like this. You've just got to find a few hours here and there. But, uh... Yeah, yeah. Hey, Lordy, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. How's your day going, Lordy? Yeah. And sounds more like physical arts and crafts. Nice sculpture, says Wombat Hole. Some of these are sculpts, and some of these are actual scans of the original things. So, like, the Cleveland skull here, this is a scan of the original. And I printed it as close to life size as I could get it. So, I couldn't find a super exact measurement, but I found one that said, what, 57 centimeters or something? So I just printed it that big, and here we are. Um, but this is scanned from the original, rather than a sculpt. Yeah. And, uh... No, it's not. That one is. The first one was Dimetrodon. Anyway, welcome, Eleonora. Thank you for the follow. It's good to have you here. Yeah. And Mama Kuhn says you could paint it during stream two? Crafting stream once in a week? I don't really have... I've tried that in the past, and it's not gone super well. Um... Yeah. It's hard for me to be able to concentrate on that and be responsive to chat at the same time. I find that my painting streams are just really boring. It's like, I wouldn't want to watch this, you know? I'm not doing anything. I'm not, I'm not interacting with chat enough. Oh yeah, yeah. Anyway. And, oh, it's, that's a very different animal trooper. That was a uh, Ceratosaurus there. But, uh, but they are both theropods. That's true. Yeah, Joe3E says, how do you know it is really a scan and not sculpted? Because it's, it's like an exact copy of the real thing. Let me show you. Um, and I've seen the real thing. And it's... This one is too perfect. There we go. Yeah. It would be... It's a lot easier to scan something like this. Either a CAT scan or a photogrammetric scan than it is to sculpt something like this. You know? Uh, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And numbers don't lie, chat doesn't actually like arts and crafts, says Lordy. Are you being sarcastic, Lordy? 
No, I do feel like my numbers drop a lot when I'm doing something like that. People just aren't as interested, you know? But yeah, yeah. And do I have a link to my 3D print rig? Um, what do you mean, Bakeyotomy? Uh, I've got a command. Let's see. There you go. Thank you, Lenina. Yeah. I've got a Prusa i3 Mark III S. I've had it for about four years now. I love that thing. It's been wonderful. And this is life-size, Mr. J. Galacta. Yeah, Dilophosaurus is a big animal. It's not a small critter. Jurassic Park kind of lied to you in that regard. Um... Yeah, there we go. This is the movie Dilophosaurus. This is actual Dilophosaurus. Based on those specimens from uh, from UCMP. Collected in Arizona. But yeah, Dilophosaurus is a big animal. Yeah, it's... Uh... It's a sizable creature, for sure. Um, it is it is so much bigger than Velociraptor. Absolutely, Saggy Iguana. Yeah, most definitely. So, yeah. Yeah. And we should always use Nedry for scale. He makes a good one, Gimpleg, I would say. Yeah. Do they really spit? We've got no evidence that they did, Trooper. No. No. Um, nor would they have needed any kind of crazy neck frill like an Australian frill neck lizard. No. If you, uh... If you want to learn more about Dilophosaurus, there's a wonderful video. Holy cow. And Saggy Iguana says, Danny, when you worked with Jack Horner, did he talk about working on Jurassic Park? Um, a f I saw him talk about that a few times at, like, public events. But when we were in the laboratory or in the field, you know, we're talking about laboratory and field stuff. So, yeah. Um, didn't really... I don't know. And Jack could be kind of... He's not the most talkative guy. One-on-one. -on -one, you know? But, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. And Blake the Snake says, if I remember correctly, Spielberg mentioned in an interview that the Dilophosaurus in the first movie was a juvenile. I don't think that's right. Because in the time since then, in the Jurassic World movies, they just keep showing Dilophosaurus and it's always the same size. As I think in the, what was the last one called? That movie was terrible. Um, there were, like, multiple Dilophosaurus, and they were all the same size. So, the reason why they made them smaller is because Spielberg didn't want them to be mixed up with the, uh, you know, with the Deinonychus, with the Velociraptor. Um, that's why they made them a different size. But it wasn't supposed to be a juvenile. At no point anywhere does anybody ever say that. Um, nor was that the intent. As far as I know. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Um. Anyway. The, the cool thing about Dilophosaurus is, uh. It's one of the first dinosaurs to have, like, dedicated web pages to it. This is still online. I think this is from, like, the. 1997 or something like that? I don't know. Maybe somebody can pull up metadata on this site. Page source. I don't know if it will actually have the dates on here. But, uh... Yeah, this is from the University of California Museum of Paleontology in Berkeley. It's just down the road from me. It's the museum where I got my start. And there is Sam Wells, 
the man who dug up and described Dilophosaurus. And this website from the 1990s is so old that uh, there were no, like, to my knowledge, there were no on-screen ways to, you know, like, on-site ways to play media at the time. You had to download a file and listen to it using a program on your computer. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. So, Sam Wells, this is... He got to see Dilophosaurus, this dinosaur that he dug up, that he studied, that he named and published. He got to see this animal become a movie star. Dilophosaurus was an obscure dinosaur before this. Nobody in the general public had ever heard of Dilophosaurus. But, uh... Here. It was quite a thrill to see Dilophosaurus as an actor in Jurassic Park. He came on, came on strong. Uh, the only two things that I would question were his ability to spit poison forward... We have no evidence of there being poison. Yep. It was quite a thrill. To... And, uh, yeah, the neck frill. Cervical vertebrae and officers are very long, and they're right under the other, making a strong support down the side of the neck. There's also a short anterior projection of the vertebrae or ribs, which would make it impossible for the animal to erect a crest. He's talking about the cervical ribs, I think. But, uh, but despite that... These are minor points, and these are, these are good, uh, good showmanship. And I enjoyed the movie thoroughly, and uh, I'm very happy to find the Dilophosaurus, uh, uh, an internationally known actor. Yeah, um, that makes me happy that Sam Wells was, was happy to see his dinosaur on the silver screen. I think that's really cool. I think that's really cool. The website is from the 6th of June, 1997. Wow, Narathos, very cool. So this would have been, I think... Just before Sam Wells passed away. Yeah. Um. Yeah, let's see. There we go. Yeah, he passed away in 1997. Um. A lot of admiration for Sam Wells. He, uh, he got started working at... The Museum of Paleontology during the Great Depression, I believe. Yeah. If you want to read more about him, here's a website. Here's a link right there. Here we go. Yeah, he passed away August 6, 1997. Oh, wow. Um... Yeah. Yeah. Cool guy. Cool guy. Uh, grew up very working class and basically just got a job uh, in the Museum of Paleontology as a technician in the fossil lab. I think they hired him through the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, during the Great Depression in, like, the late 1930s. Um... Yeah. <laughs> As a staff member, he was permitted to enroll in one course per semester at the university. He could take one class every semester for free, because he couldn't, I guess, didn't otherwise have the, the wherewithal to take classes. During the early 1930s, he mastered the geology, zoology, and paleontology courses required for graduate study. Then he earned his doctorate in paleontology in 1940, the dissertation on Cretaceous plesiosaurs. So he really worked his way up from the bottom. Sam Wells. Yeah. And I, we actually have some footage of him, I think. Um, let's see. We were watching an old documentary the other day. And I think it was here. Yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. Very 70s. Yeah. 
Encyclopedia Britannica Educational Corporation presents From Life on Earth Dinosaurs <laughs> The Terrible Lizards Hmm That should be an alert right there Um Where's the part with Sam Wells? Here he is Or even descendants of the Terrible Lizards and do we have more clips of St. Wells? I think we do. Once ruled the earth. Yeah. The importance of the reptiles. There he is. They were the dominant animals. They were the uh, animals occupying the swamps, the highlands, and the air and the sea. And I'll see you later, Alexander. Thanks for being here. With a large yeah. number of reptiles. Among them, the closest thing to a sea serpent that ever lived, the mosasaur. Yeah, so Sam Wilson worked on mosasaurs and plesiosaurs this and dinosaurs as well. Sea going lizard that ranged up to 12 meters in length. Pretty cool. Yeah. To adapt to their watery environment, they Anyway, uh, but speaking of Dilophosaurus, I should share this video with you. If you want to be brought up to date on this animal and what it was actually like in real life, this video will do it for you. There you go. Good night to you, Mr. Jiglock. Thanks for being here. evolved into giants. They started out relatively tiny and lived in a world with a bizarre diversity of strange creatures that ruled the forests and swamps of the Triassic period. Abundant fossils of this strange ancient world have been found <laughs> in a the there in the water. Park in Arizona, yeah. where paleontologist Dr. Adam Marsh has been diligently working to uncover the mysteries of the early evolution of dinosaurs in North America. Hi. Anyway. I'm Adam. So let's get to Dilophosaurus, though. Um, here we go. Yeah. In dinosaur evolution. The early Jurassic period. The Dilophosaurus was first discovered by a Navajo man named Jesse Williams in 1940. Yep. And excavated in 1942 by paleontologist Sam Wells and Wyan Langston Jr. What they found were several skeletons of the oldest large predatory dinosaur, yet discovered in North America. Yep. And look how different the skull looks there. Hmm. Interesting, right? Yeah. Despite its early discovery and its huge significance to our... And we're not going to go over the whole video, Mr. Big Lockton. First large and you've got surgery tomorrow. Well, shoot, I really hope it goes well. Uh, Mr. J, holy cow. Um, good luck with that. I'm sure it's going to go great. Dinosaurs. Yeah. Dilophosaurus has never been thoroughly scientifically described until yeah. now. For the last hmm. six years, Adam Marsh has been painstakingly describing and analyzing every bone of every known skeleton attributed to Dilophosaurus, including several new specimens, to determine where they belong in the family tree of dinosaurs. Adam's new analysis has revealed that the truth about Dilophosaurus is even stranger than its depictions in fiction. Pretty cool. Way cooler than in Jurassic Park. Richard Bam. Well, well, well. Richard Bam? How did your stream go? Welcome to Paleontologizing. Holy cow. Good stuff. And Powerhouse G, thank you for being here. The only deaf guy. How are you doing? It is good to have you here. Double Trouble Raid, there you go. Good stuff. Only deaf guy, how did your stream go? Two streams in quick succession. That is beautiful. I really appreciate it. Welcome back to Paleontologizer. Let me make sure that my closed captions are working, too. I'm reminded I should check accessibility here. Testing, testing, closed captions. Pinky with Attitude, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizer. Yeah, good stuff. 
good stuff. Uh, Def Squad Raid. Welcome, Terry. Richard Bam, the only deaf guy. Dark Phoenix Fire Powerhouse G. It's so good to have all of you here. Welcome back to Paleontologizing. Pinky, it's good to have you here too. Holy cow. If anybody here is new, and some of you are, let me introduce myself real quick. Uh, my name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. You probably know already that a paleontologist is a fossil scientist. A scientist who works on fossils, not a fossilized scientist, but a scientist who works on fossils. That's me. I work on dinosaur fossils in particular. I study dinosaurs. I publish on them in the scientific literature. I dig dinosaurs up during the summers. Uh, we were actually doing fieldwork live streams this past summer, working in Utah and Wyoming, and digging up at least three new species of dinosaur just this year, and we were live streaming that. So check out the YouTube page if you want to see those videos. Good stuff. And a fossilized scientist would also be cool. Yeah, that'd be publication worthy there. Charlie's Dragon. Yeah. And Hugan says, I tagged you in a pic on Twitter of a Path of Titans Dilophosaurus. Interesting. Okay. Check that out. And Diagonal says, Danny should print 3D print Cope's skull. Hey, if anybody's got files for that, Diagonal, I would gladly do it. But I don't think that's available. <laughs> I don't know if they'll ever let that thing out of the museum again after what Luis y Hoyos did with it. Yeah. And only deaf guy says stream was good, dude. Started out on a new build and then played some modded Minecraft. Good, I'm glad that was good. It sounds like fun. And I've been doing really well, only deaf guy, really well. I've got a a new place. I moved about a month ago. And uh, what do you think of my new office here? I'm still setting things up a little bit. Haven't settled in completely yet, but we're uh, we're working on that. Yeah. Uh, like new office? Thank you. I appreciate that. I do too. Pretty happy about it. Yeah. Uh. But yeah. Yeah. A neat dino quiz. Uh, what kind of a quiz is it now? What do you mean? Is it something I could do really quickly? And yeah. I don't know. I can't guarantee you I'll do it, but I'll take a look at it at least. Yeah. And Bakeyotomy, weird power struggle. Uh, not really. I feel like my fieldwork experiences have been pretty good, and I've never really had too much conflict with fellow paleo people in the field. There has been some conflict with other people. Somebody shot at me once. A hunter, like, shot at me one time. Maybe thinking I was a deer or something? Um... It's a long story. And uh, have a good... Thank you, only deaf guy. Thank you for raiding, and I appreciate you. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks for bringing your crew here. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. I was a member of Cope's crew. <laughs> she didn't make him airspace. No, it was a... Some knucklehead and a lifted... Dodge pickup truck. Uh, yeah, he missed, thankfully. You hear Antler hat in the film. There you go, HD. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, let's get back to this. Talking about Dilophosaurus a little bit, uh, because of course I've got my Dilophosaurus skull here on the wall today. Uh. Really cool dinosaur. One of my favorite dinosaurs, honestly. This is now out of date. It, uh, it really should be updated. Uh, but it hasn't been yet. Why should it be updated? Well, because of the work by people like Adam Marsh and Brian Eng. Yeah. When and can you link that, Sloppy? Discovered, it was considered a species of Megalosaurus. 
Yeah. Until the discovery of the famous tall crested specimen revealed that it actually had two large crests on its head. It yep. was then renamed and reinterpreted as a sort of convenient intermediary between the small coelophysoid therapy the coelophysoids like Procomp signatus that we were talking about earlier today. ...pods of the Triassic and the later crested ceratosaurs of the late Jurassic. Yep, like my ceratosaurus Halloween costume. Remember that? Um... There we go. Uh, yeah. Ceratosaurus. That's great. Let me go get that real quick. There we are. Ceratosaurus nasicornis. Uh, this is actually a sculpt. I sculpted this myself because all of the available files of Ceratosaurus were too narrow, kind of side to side like this, and none of them could possibly fit my noggin inside. And so I had to basically just sculpt one from scratch with very close attention to detail to make sure it was anatomically correct. So, uh, yeah, Ceratosaurus, horned lizard. Um, and so yeah, to recap here, Dilophosaurus was thought Originally, it was just kind of slotted in there. It's like, oh, yeah, it's this nice kind of intermediary between these. Um, turns out it's not. Large crest on its head. It was then renamed and reinterpreted as a sort of convenient intermediary between the small coelophysoid theropods of the Triassic and the later crested ceratosaurs of the late Jurassic. Yeah. But Adam's analysis reveals something fascinating. Dilophosaurus isn't closely related to any of these animals. Instead, huh. it forms a strange grade of theropods, along with Zupiosaurus from South America and Cryolophosaurus from Antarctica. Yeah. And none of these dinosaurs were... Cryolophosaurus, which is... There. Right up there. Cryolophosaurus. There's William Stout's Cryolophosaurus painting, which is uh, one of my favorite dinosaur paintings ever done. Yeah. Anyway. Good stuff. That's a really cool critter, Cryolophosaurus. The frozen crested lizard. And it does not seem to be closely related to Monolophosaurus. Monolophosaurus, I think, is either regarded as a Megalosaur relative or more likely a Tyrannosauroid relative, I think. Salamander, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, Return of Samsman? Return, Return of Sandsman. How are you doing? My first time I'm back on Twitch in a long while. There's some sort of Discord server, so I can post a picture of my first attempted at fossil prep. We do have a Discord there. Sandsman, yeah. Welcome to Paleontologizing, by the way. It's good to have you here. Um, we might even have a fossil fossils channel in the Discord. But yeah, check it out. Yeah. And Richard Bam says, David. I'm not David Attenborough. Richard Bam. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Danny Anduza. What do you think of the new Pliosaur? I think it's terrifying. It's cool, and I really hope that they... Yeah, that's okay, Richard. <laughs> Things get auto-corrected, and, uh... Yeah, I understand, especially if you're on a, if you're on mobile. But, uh... Yeah, and that's the one the BBC covered. Yes, now, it's cool stuff. I just wish that the guy who found it had been properly credited in the BBC documentary. Yeah. Um. Here, take a look at this. The battle between T Rex and our Pliosaur. Who's going to win? <laughs> 
They lived at different times in different places in different environments. Is a world leading expert in 3D visualization of fossils. Nice. First thoughts this thing is absolutely massive, and I will also add that the level of preservation is amazing. There's this common misconception that fossilization is just this really common thing, and we get these complete skulls all the time, and that's sadly not the case. This is actually a one in a million, one be one in a billion type specimen here. Very cool. Using the latest technology, Andre is carrying out the world's first surface scan of a pliosaur skull. Anyway, where was the... was it here? Uh... Around 10 meters. They're thought to have been around 10 meters in length. That's about the size of a double-decker bus. Yeah... Um... Let's try this. Now to the story of a sea monster with 130 razor-sharp teeth, the biting force of a T-Rex and a skull measuring two meters. It might sound like the stuff of legend, but this creature really did exist around 75 million years ago. Oh yeah, and it's a it short-necked plesiosaur. And a fossil of its enormous jaws has been now found off Dorset's Jurassic Coast. Our science editor, Rebecca Morell, went for an exclusive look. Hmm. Okay. Take a look at that. There you go. It's yeah. huge. Unveiling a Jurassic sea monster. This is the two meter long skull of a pliosaur. That's one of gorgeous. the most fearsome predators the planet has ever seen. So he's got big teeth, excellent for stabbing and killing its prey. Look at that carina on there. The bits. Cutting and edge. Digest. Throws it back yeah. to get in there. And the... digest the bone and everything. Steve Etches led the efforts right to unearth and prepare right. this ancient aquatic beast. So what makes this unique is it's complete. So the lower jaws and the upper skull are meshed together as it would be in life. To find that, I think worldwide, <laughs> there's hardly any specimens ever found to that level of detail. And if they are, a lot of the bits are missing. Whereas this, although it's slightly distorted, it's got every bone present. It's one of the best fossils I've ever worked on. I'll never probably work on another one. So this guy did not get proper credit in the BBC documentary. That was a massive, I would say, shameful oversight. And... Yeah. Here. Denver was tweeting about this. Uh, Philip Jacobs deserved to be properly acknowledged by name in the show. It is hard for academic institutions to encourage non-professionals to donate fossils when things like this happen. BBC, show some class and correct this ASAP, please. Um, yeah. <sighs> he says, I've been completely airbrushed out of my own discovery and gift, not even a mention. Both Helen and I are appalled, I have no words. So yeah, yeah. He says, take a look at this comment by Philip Jacobs from Elsewhere, BBC. Imagine making the find of your life, contacting the right people, donating the fossil to a museum, uh, then staying silent, you know, like, they probably asked him to keep quiet about this because they're waiting for the documentary and everything, and they want to kind of own the, the narrative around this, so he keeps quiet about it. Waiting for this great TV show, and then they don't even say your name. Awful. So Philip Jacobs says, I actually cried as the documentary neared its end. I just couldn't believe that they would do that. Especially with all the interview footage they had. And when I came to my museum and examined the complete skull for the first time, it was all filmed by BBC teams. And they cut it all out. You know? Shameful. Hopefully they're correcting this. Because that is colossal failure on their part. Absolutely, Lenina. Yeah. Yeah. Um. But yeah. Eh. Very disappointing. And yeah, Charlie's Dragon. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing, is that if you're going to cut anything for time, 
don't cut out the person that made the discovery in the first place. I mean, sure, he doesn't have credentials, but, you know, and she, I don't know. It just seems like more classism by the BBC, honestly. Like, cutting working class people out of, out of the story. Very convenient, you know? Uh, yeah. Certainly, there are many more dinosaurs waiting to be discovered. Many new mysteries waiting to be pondered. Honey Q, thank you for the follow and welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Yeah. Yeah. And Charlie's Dragon says he has credentials. I mean, that's the thing. When I said credentials, I meant, you know, uh, a degree or a title at a you know, a job title or something like that, but no, he has something better. He made a discovery. And, like, that should be acknowledged and celebrated. You know? He did that. Yeah. And yeah, there you go, Charlie Sturgeon. I agree. I agree. <laughs> so anyway, that's the Pliosaur thing, and that's... That's that. Um... I wonder if... Um... I'm looking for any news related to this. There we go. Yeah. Excellent. Well, let's see about this first. BBC accused of airbrushing amateur fossil finder out of David Attenborough's Sea Monster documentary as naming petition passes 2,000 signatures. Yeah. The BBC has come under fire from the scientific community after a David Attenborough documentary about a recently discovered underwater creature only briefly mentioned the fossil finder who found it. Yeah. Uh, this particular find is being quoted as one of the most significant fossils to ever have been found, wrote Anna Morell, who began the petition. Uh, that's the most significant fossil ever. That's maybe a bit of a bit of hyperbole, but okay. Uh, it is unique. It is huge. It is significant. And yet, Philip's name is being effectively airbrushed from the historical record when it comes to this important find. Much of the global promotion media fails to mention him. Yeah. Uh, Attenborough had become aware of the find through a collector friend who lived close to the discovery and informed BBC Studios Natural History Unit executive producer Mike Gunton, who quickly sold the project to the network and gathered a filming crew together. In a follow-up post yesterday, Jacobs said the Etches Collection, the independent museum organizing the work uh, with the BBC on the film, was doing everything in their power to see that it, there is full attribution as to who first discovered the giant pliosaur. And it looks like that's happened. BBC amends Attenborough show to give Fossil Hunter more credit for pliosaur fun. Philip Jacobs was originally named only in the credits of Attenborough and the giant sea monster. Oh, boy. Yeah. Uh, so more than 5,000 people signed that petition. Yeah. Uh, Jacob is an artist and textile designer from West Bexington, Dorset, said, Well, it would have been nice to have my name actually spoken by Sir David, rather than being described as uh, a fossil enthusiast. I am pleased that the BBC has made amends, and I would like to thank the producer for working on trying to correct this omission. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. I don't know. It sounds like if that was just 
an oversight. It was a bad one. And kind of... I don't know who's to blame for that, but... Not good. Not good. Yeah. Oh, they actually said amateur fossil finder but left out his name? Yeah, HD. That's how it happened. Yeah. I know. I'm sure David Attenborough was not responsible for it. Ought to do it. Definitely not. Yeah. Um, and here, I'll give you a link to this. This is from uh, The Guardian. Yeah. Anyway. And... Hang on. I hear cat noises. See if I can draw a cat in here. No, I don't know. Hmm. Well, hello, Mini Pie. Oh. Can I draw you over here? Hang on a second. see if she wants to approach. Uh, um, come here. Ooh, there you go. <laughs> There's Minnie Pie. How you doing? Yeah, everyone, this is one of my landlords. This is Minnie Pie here. And she's come to explore. Good stuff? What do you think? Pretty good? Pretty good? Let's get you another one. Noises? What do you think? What's going on? Just slop around my desk. You're making a mess, Mini Pie. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Well, everybody. Mini Pie. Landlords here. <laughs> yeah, do you like that? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. She's 
type of messages in the chat. <laughs> Uh, there she goes. All right, I'll see you later, Mini Pie. Thanks for stopping by. Always got to appease the landlords, you know. Yeah. Good stuff. <laughs> and Metazua just refreshed. Well, let's go ahead and do that. Real men grow beards. Let's do that right now. Yeah. Excellent. So Metazoo, for those of you not familiar, is a, an online guessing game. And we have a new one. It refreshes every 24 hours. We got a new mystery animal. And I have to try and guess what it is using phylogeny, the tree of life, you know? Nerthus says, start with cat. You know, that's that's a good place to start. That's relevant. Let's do cat. I like to start off with a placental mammal at the beginning. Because this game does tend to be a little bit mammal heavy. Well, so we'll start with... And that was a good bet. This is a eutherian mammal. So yeah, that almost looks like a tree shrew right there. Which is very much a eutherian. So the way that this works is you type in a guess into this box, and then, you know, any animal at all, a sea sponge, a uh, uh, Madagascar hissing cockroach, a bottlenose dolphin, and it will tell you the most exclusive group that contains your guess and today's mystery animal. So right now, I guessed cat, and we've got eutheria. Eutheria are the placental mammals. I'll show you. See sponge run, run sponge run, says Mirror's face. Yeah. Um, placental mammals. Eutheria. So we know it's one of these critters. So down from 1.4 million animals, we're now down to 4,700. So with one guess, we've narrowed it down quite a bit. We know it's some kind of eutherian mammal. But if we're really smart about this, we can determine even more than that. Since I guessed cat... And cats are borotherian mammals. Cats are carnivorans, which belong to Laurasia theria, which is part of borotheria. We know it's not going to be one of those. It's not borotheria and it's not Laurasia theria, which means that it's got to be part of Atlantogenata. So this includes the Afrotheres, critters like elephants. Sengis, Golden Moles, Tenrex, uh, Aardvarks, and it also includes uh, things like Armadillos, and I think the other Xenarthrans, Armadillos, Anteaters, and Sloths. There's only 30 species of them, but there's more Afrotheres, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to guess an Afrotheer. Um, let's do an Elephant. Let's try... Elephant. And if it's not within Afrotheria, then we know it's within Xenarthra. Or something like that. Let's see. It is an Afrotheria. Well, well, well. Yeah. Good stuff. Uh, and yes, Celtic Elephant. Perfect time for you to show up. Welcome, welcome. Our mystery animal is within Afrotheria, but it is not an elephant. Um, and it's probably not going to be a dugong or a hippo either. No, oh, no, hang on. Sorry. Hippos are artiodactyls. What am I saying? Probably not going to be a dugong either. Well, let's see. So we know it is an Afrotheer. But these clades don't even have names. Interesting. Oh, this could get tricky. 
This could get tricky. Um, because these clades don't have names here, and I don't know if. Afrotheers are a really bizarre group, and it's kind of hard to narrow them down. Elephant Shrew is not an option. Golden Mole is not an option. Um, Penrek is not an option. Aardvark is an option. Although Aardvarks, there's only one species of Aardvark. And so I'm not really cutting many of those out if I guess Aardvark. Um, so it could be an Aardvark, but... Maybe it's a Cyrenian, you know? It's a sea cow. So let's see if Dugong or Manatee are options here. Dugong is not. But Manatee is. Let's guess Manatee. And we'll see. It's not a manatee. Shoot. Could it be a Hyrax? Hyrax is not an option. Let's try Aardvark. All right. Good stuff. Good stuff. I should have. Uh, I should have done that one first, but that's okay. Yeah, Aardvark. Not too shabby. Um, and we are on a three streak here. Very good. Of course, I've played this game 19 times. I've won 19 times. Undefeated. Count those wins. And today's three guesses. No, four guesses. Not too shabby. Not too shabby at all. But yeah. You follow the same exact guesses as me? Nice, Real Man Greybeards. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. And HD says Aardvark was the clear choice alphabetically. Of course, that's how this works. Always. You know? <laughs> uh, let's, uh, let's find a video on Aardvarks, shall we? Um... Let's try this from Animal Fact Files. Today on Animal Fact Files, we're to Today on Animal Fact Files, I'm going to go wipe some cat hair off my face because it's like clinging to my beard. Ugh. Um, I'll be right back. Enjoy these aardvarks until my imminent return. Discussing aardvarks. With the ears of a donkey, the tail of a rat, and the stature of a domestic pig, one may be surprised to learn that aardvarks are more closely related to sea cows than warthogs. Aardvarks are the only living members of their order and descend from an ancient lineage of hooved animals. One look at their feet and this becomes apparent. Aardvarks are burrowing mammals. They use their strong front feet to dig out dens which they utilize for rest and escaping predators. They're shy and nocturnal. They're rarely seen by humans. Many people don't even know they exist. Some may be familiar with the name because of Arthur. Though Arthur the Aardvark's modern depiction leaves one wondering if he's meant to be a bear, his original design looked more Aardvarky. It may st Do they say hoofed mammals? Because <sighs> we mean hoofed in a colloquial sense. I assume they don't mean they descended from ungulates because they're not. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, Aardvark Denier says Basil. Oh yeah, yeah, shoot. That's the thing is that like, we're talking about like dinosaur deniers on TikTok and stuff. People who claim that like, oh, I don't believe in dinosaurs. First of all, I don't believe those people. I don't believe that they don't believe in dinosaurs. But like, it's only because they've heard of dinosaurs that they even feel compelled to say that. They wouldn't say that about, I don't know, um, Elasmosaurs. They wouldn't say it about Rawasukians. They wouldn't say it about Aedosaurs. Or Sprassodonts, or some other kind of extinct group that they've never heard of. It's like... Yeah. But there is probably a... Wasn't there a thing on TikTok a while ago, too, where... 
people were saying that penguins don't exist. I think it ties in with Flat Earth. Where they don't think that Antarctica exists, and thus they don't think that penguins exist. Or at least that's what they claim. I don't think they actually believe that. I don't think these people are being honest. At that point, they're just saying stuff. They're just throwing things at the wall and seeing what sticks. You know? Um, so I'm not... I don't know. Maybe the, the, the less time spent thinking about such people, the better. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Flat aardvark theory. There you go. Basil. <laughs> and yeah, the parody conspiracy. Birds are real. Yeah. Yeah. And Australia isn't real. No, there was another thing that, um... What was it? Was it Finland? Yeah. There is no Finland. Birth of a conspiracy theory. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll give you a link to this. A pretty, pretty good, uh, like science and history podcast here called Skeptoid. It's about, you know, skepticism. Oh, and there's an Australia one too. Oh boy, Australia doesn't exist. Another geographic conspiracy theories. Um, yeah, here's this one too. Yeah. And and there you go, Quiz Tech. I know, right? Anyway, enough of this nonsense. Let's get back to let's get back to Aardvarks. Still be surprising to learn just how big Aardvarks are though. Yeah. If you asked me before this episode, I would have guessed an Aardvark was about the size of an armadillo. But that's too small. I mean they're probably about the size of a large dog, right? I think I've seen Aardvarks in a zoo before, and they're about the size of like a big German shepherd. Yeah. On average, aardvarks stand about two feet tall at the shoulders wow. and weigh anywhere from 90 to 180 pounds. If oh, you boy. fall down next to an aardvark, you would be approximately eye level with it. They're huh. bigger than most dogs and larger by weight than many humans. <laughs> While aardvarks have a Pretty similar cool. face to the iconic anteater, these animals aren't closely related. They're not. In fact, yeah. Aardvarks are more closely related to elephants and hyraxes than an anteater. Yep, they're the afrotheres. Between these two ant-eating animals is an example of convergent evolution, where two unrelated animals display similar traits. In this yep. case, a long nose and an even longer tongue for lapping up insects. Pretty Art cool. Marks specialize in ants and termites, but they also eat scarab beetle grubs, grasshoppers, and melon-like fruits of the cucumber family that grow underground. These huh. are aptly named the aardvark cucumber and are dependent on aardvarks to eat them in order to spread their seeds. How oh, cool! Aardvarks live throughout most of sub-Saharan Africa. They can be found in most habitats, but generally avoid the dense, rocky soil of mountainous regions and the moist. And you have a beautiful aardvark at the Fresno Chaffee Zoo. That's super cool, Otter. Love watching it walk so regal. They're they're interesting critters. They're so soil neat. Soil of rainforests. Yeah. They like soft, easy to dig soil they can sink their feet into. Aardvarks have furry noses that can close while they dig to keep the dirt out. <laughs> their large ears, which may be used for thermoregulation like in elephants, can turn back and seal out dirt as well. Huh. Aardvarks reach reproductive maturity around two years of age. Males don't stick around after mating, and a female gestates about seven months before giving birth to a single baby. Hmm. The baby spends its first two weeks in its birth den, but then begins to venture out with mom. Females, who are smaller than males, may also have a brighter tail than males. This may help huh. their baby follow them above ground. Interesting. The baby begins to eat insects at three months of age, and digs its own burrows at six months. Males part ways with their mothers after their first year but females may remain another year while their mother raises another baby. Outside of mating and raising their young, aardvarks are considered solitary. They spend their days resting in a burrow. An aardvark's burrow may extend just a few feet up to 20 feet underground. Wow. At night, they forage. So again, burrowing is such a common behavior among different animals, especially among mammals. There are so many different mammal groups that will burrow like this, and that's, that's really cool. Um... 
Oh, and very cool, Dinosaur Dave. Hey, I will see you. You're sending some ants to science streams? That is super exciting, Dinosaur Dave. Very cool. Very cool. They'll keep the same burrow for a few days to weeks before setting off to find a new place to live. Welcome, Jody Fish. How These you doing? abandoned burrows provide homes uh, for other animals, such as warthogs and jackals, and hmm. even some aardvark predators like hyenas. Other predators to aardvarks include lions and leopards, as well as humans. There you go, real men, yeah. If yeah. they can avoid these predators, they may live to be nearly 20 years old in the wild. Hmm. For more facts on aardvarks, check out the links below. Give a thumbs cool up if you learned something new today. Thank you to our patrons, Spike Spiegel93, Dad, and yeah. Alex for their support of this channel. Thank you to these viewers for today's re Good stuff. There's a... I do call myself an expert in dinosaur studies. All right, Bearded Fortress. Well, thank you for these six months of support there. Excellent. Excellent. Good stuff. Yeah. Um, oh, and there's a link to that video there. Good stuff. Good stuff. Jody Fish, did I welcome you yet? Welcome, Jody Fish. Howdy, howdy. And yeah, we are getting ever closer to our Partner Plus goal. Yeah. Uh... uh Excellent. Now, uh, we were talking about something yesterday. We were talking about homology and why it's important, and we never really got a chance to finish that discussion. So I think maybe we'll jump back into that. I realized that I'd pulled up that Neil Shubin documentary. about well we talk a bit about homology in it and uh here we go this is like a really really important concept what dinosaurs looked like we now need to know how they lived well there you go blue front thank you for the 31 months of support holy cow blue front holy cow do i appreciate that uh, appreciate you more than you know. You and, and Lenina, obviously. Holy cow. Um, woot indeed, Lenina. Yes. Uh, good stuff. Thank you both for all of your support to this channel over the years. I, uh, it wouldn't be the same here without you. It really wouldn't be, so thank you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. Basil says, is that one of those boomerang-headed amphibians? Who? Uh, no, this is Tiktaalik right here. Another 3D print that I need to, uh... Uh, to paint and... Well, to seal and smooth and then paint so I can put on display. But yeah, what you're thinking of is Diplocalus, Basil. I betcha. Um, Diplocalus is this critter. Yeah. Anyway, we're going to talk about homology here. Yeah. On top of the world with the most important discovery of my life. But it begins in the city of Chicago with a room full of human cadavers. And students, too. Yeah. It was more than a decade ago, and I just moved to the University of Chicago as chairman of the anatomy department. And I remember, you know, hanging around with the students around the tables here, uh, just getting to know them and letting them get to know me. They're launching their careers as future physicians, and there's some nerves and skittishness those first few days. And they almost invariably ask, Dr. Shubin, what, what kind of doctor are you? You know, are you a surgeon? Are you a cardiologist? And I'd say, well, no, I'm a, I'm a fish paleontologist. <laughs> and it's like, give this look like, well, what? I want my money back. <laughs> but holy cow, is this a perspective that, that the students uh, need? 50,000 a year has been well spent. And holy cow, Blue Front, did you just upgrade to a tier three there? Holy cow, Blue Front. Do I appreciate that? Oh, and thank you. Uh, Artorius the Maximus for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Thanks for following. 
Um, holy cow, blue front, that is extraordinary. Tier 3, thank you for helping us get to our Partner Plus goal. Holy cow, Blue Front. That is very generous of you, and I... It's gonna get us closer to that revenue goal. I, uh... That's six points right there. Not one, not two. Not even three, four, or five. Six points. Blue Front, thank you very much for that generosity. I do really appreciate it. Holy cow. Uh, the keyboard on his laptop is dying, so you can't type very efficiently right now. That's okay, Lenina. Um, I will not ask Blue Front to respond quickly. <laughs> Man, I've had that happen before, where like the keyboard just isn't working properly, and it I'm trying to type into Twitch chat, and it's not a good feeling. So, Blue Front, just relax and thank you again so much. I really appreciate you. Holy cow. Um. But yeah, yeah. Here. Uh I kinda love this story, you know. What what kind of what kind of doctor are you, Dr. Schubin? And they'd almost invariably ask, Dr. Schubin, what, what kind of doctor are you? You know, are you a surgeon? Are you a cardiologist? And I'd say, Well, no, I'm a I'm a fish paleontologist. And he's <laughs> like, they just look like, well, what? I want my money back. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, oh man. Do doctors, medical doctors, MDs, do they need this kind of perspective, in my opinion? I mean, holy cow. Having an understanding of the human body that comes from an evolutionary perspective is so important. Like, this should absolutely be a required part of, of medical school. Um... Shoot, because I've had some bad experiences with some doctors who, like, did not know their stuff. And it's like, if they had had, you know, uh, a teacher like this, they would have been better doctors. Don't get me started. Holy cow. Yeah. But it soon became clear that being a paleontologist, and not just any paleontologist, a fish paleontologist, is a very powerful way to teach human anatomy. Because oh, yeah. Often some of the best roadmaps to our own bodies are seen in other creatures. Yep. There's a reason for that. It's called homology. And did I post this link? Which link ought to do it? This one here? I did not. Let me give it to you. You might not think your body has much in common with a fish, but I see there you go. resemblance. On the surface, you're not very fish-like, I'll admit. But you are related to them, and the clues yep. to that connection are etched in ancient stone. Fossils unearthed around uh, the world reveal that fish are the... Otter says, my partner is an MD. I'll show her. Yeah, I'm sure she'd love this. This is... Holy cow, this is one of the coolest documentaries to show people who maybe even don't think that they're particularly interested in fossil science. Because this makes it relevant to our everyday lives. Um, I showed my mom and her sister, my Auntie Kathy, uh, this video uh, this is a couple years ago. And they loved it. And they're not, like, science people. But they really got a kick out of this. Uh, so I, it, it has wide appeal. It's just so well done. And Neil Shubin makes a fantastic host. Uh, except she hates fish. Well, there's some fish in the first episode, but not so much in episodes two and three. First creatures with bone yeah. skeletons. They have backbones and skulls, just like you and me. This shared anatomy connects us to fish and to a long line of other animals. Yep. To see what I mean. Jerry Rick says, what is the nerve that proves that we are fit? Oh, there's so many, Jerry Rick. There's a whole bunch. 
It's basically most of them. <laughs> There's no, like, one particular nerve. There is a whole suite of different characteristics that, uh, that show that not only are we as humans fish, but all land-living vertebrate animals. Um, yeah. Unless you're thinking about the notochord, which is the precursor to, like, our vertebral column, our, our backbone. Yeah. Imagine the complete history of life on a giant family tree. Here we go. The first microscopic organisms billions of years ago to all animals alive today. Yep. Our history lies on one branch of this tree of life. And we can trace our ancestry back. Here we go. Around 400 million years ago, you'll find fish swimming in oceans and streams. 40 million years later, the first amphibians appear on land. Hmm. Then we see reptiles, followed by the first mammals around 200 million years ago. All little mammals. Much later, we arrive at our special branch, primates. Yeah, those this hands. tells us something remarkable. Every reptile, bird, and mammal alive today is descended from ancient fish. And that includes us. There you go. Yeah. So how does this legacy play out in our anatomy? Each one of us. Um, let me... Okay, I'll get to that part. Well, let's let's skip this part and let's get to this. There we go. So where did this marvel of evolution come from? Yeah, the human hand. It clearly has deep roots in the past. And you can see evidence of that in the bones of modern creatures. Yep. Homology. So 150 years ago, scientists were finding connections between the hands and limbs of four-legged animals. Sir Richard Owen was an anatomist in the 19th century. He was fortunate to be an anatomist in an age of discovery. So Richard Owen was the guy who actually coined the word dinosaur back in 1842. Yeah. Richard Owen, he was at one time one of the most famous scientists in the world. Uh, here he is with a fossil of, I think it's a veranded lizard? That might be Megalania right there. Yeah. Uh, so, Victor uh, scientist in the Victorian era. Here he is with Dinornis. Uh, here's a caricature of him riding a giant ground sloth like a horse. Um, there we go. <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah. So, that's Richard Owen. In the 19th century, he was fortunate to be an anatomist in an age of discovery. And so people were coming back to London with new and oddball creatures for him to analyze. And in analyzing all the different creatures, he found common patterns. Yep. Although the overall shape and structure of each limb was very different, he started to see that there was an underlying theme. Mm -hmm. It was as if the same set of bones was being squashed or extended to perform different functions. That's exactly what's going on. Here's a dog. Dogs, you know, run and jump. What do you have? One bone, two bones, little bones, and then the digits, the equivalents of the fingers or toes. And, of course, here's a bird. Its limb has been modified into a wing, and it has one bone. Humerus. Two bones. Radius and ulna. Lots of bones. Carpals, metacarpals, phalanges. The amazing fact is, in each of these creatures, the skeletal architecture is largely the same as ours. Yep. And what was utterly surprising 
is that the skeleton of every animal walking the earth today has this fundamental pattern of one bone, two bones, little bones, fingers. Not every animal. Shoot, let's let's not be vertebrate chauvinists here. Um, invertebrates do not have this because they don't have bones. But vertebrate animal, every vertebrate animal walking the earth today, every animal with bones has got the same pattern of bones. Without exception. They all have that. They're modified in different animals. Certain ones, like snakes, are modified lizards. They've lost their limbs. The vertebrae are the same. The ribs are the same. The skull bones are the same. The tail bones are the same. And it's like, well, why is that? Why is that? Owen didn't know why creatures had that pattern. It was a mystery to him. It really took a new insight. An insight from Charles Darwin. Well, Chuck E. D. said, the reason why animals have this common pattern is because at some time in the distant past, they all shared a common ancestor that had a yep. version of this pattern too. Yep. According to Darwin, we should be able to trace the evolution of our limbs and hands by going back in time down our family tree. Starting with our primate ancestors, we see hands and limbs that look very similar to our own. Yep. Go back a bit further to the first mammals, and we find deeper similarities in the paws. And we see how paws emerged from more distant relatives. And if we go back even further, we reach our most distant four-legged ancestors. Yeah, those basal tetrapods. The earliest tetrapods were among the first to have Owen's one bone, two bones, lots of bones pattern. Yep. But when we enter the underwater world around 400 million years ago, instead of animals with limbs, we find prehistoric fish with fins. Mm -hmm. And that brings us to a great mystery of biology. How did we get from fish with fins to animals with arms and legs? Well, we now understand how that happened because we have the fossils that show that transition, which is super cool. Anyway, I think it's a nice little introduction to homology there. And, uh... Where did that go? This is what we were talking about yesterday. Let's go back to the beginning here. Um, because this seemed like it was gonna be a really good video. We got to the part with pandas here, and then I think we stopped. We got distracted. We went off onto other topics, so let's do this one. Yeah. And Wombat Hole says ducks have 16 or fewer neck vertebrae. Geese have 17 to 23. Swans have 24 or more. Not sure how that works. You mean like how you evolve more or fewer? It just happens. I mean, shoot right there. And geese can have 17 to 23. That number can change not just between different species, but sometimes in the same species. Like you can have siblings that have different numbers of neck vertebrae in uh in certain group animal groups um yeah we actually think that there might be uh there might be animals that actually change their number of neck vertebrae during ontogeny so like during the animal's lifespan it might gain or lose neck vertebrae which is really cool but yeah in 1799 a strange animal skin landed in the hands of biologist george shaw Ontogeny. So features, Shaw noticed the perfect resemblance of the beak of a duck engrafted on the head of a quadruped. So accurate is the similitude that at first view it naturally excites the idea of some deceptive preparation by artificial means. So basically, <laughs> this thing seriously looks like a duck bill sewn on some fur. That animal, the platypus, is very much real. And even weirder than Shaw realized, platypuses lay eggs. They sweat. And Charlie's Dragon says, I would have thought different numbers of neck vertebrae would mess with a lot of things. It does for mammals. Yeah. Not for other groups of creatures. Not necessarily for reptiles, birds among them. Um, rept with reptiles, like, you can kind of just have more neck vertebrae and it kind of doesn't matter. 
an excellent example would be the uh, the elasmosaurs, a group of really long-necked plesiosaurs. They can have over 70 neck vertebrae. So having a mutation that gives you a higher number of neck vertebrae is not deleterious to them. These were very successful animals, and their necks just kept getting longer and longer. So, like, a beneficial mutation that gives you a longer neck with more neck vertebrae? They did this again and again and again. It just kept happening for them. So, yeah. Yeah. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Anyway. Back to... Phylogeny. Which, homology is, like, a key a key concept for understanding phylogeny, how different creatures are, are related to one another. Wet milk through their skin and they're venomous to boot. They're also mammals like us, but they're a different kind of mammal. One that's split off from the rest back when the dinosaurs were still around. Today, they are one of only two living members of that weird, wonderful lineage. We call the study of branching evolution- And strictly speaking, I think it'd be five or six or seven. Aren't there like five species of echidna and one species of platypus? Here, let's jump from sea cows to monotremes. The monotremata. Yeah. Monotremes. They're saying there's five living species here. One is the platypus. And then you've got at least four species of echidna. But I don't think they have... Do they have Attenborough's echidna? They do. Attenborough's long-beaked echidna. Western long-beaked echidna. Eastern long-beaked echidna. And the short-beaked echidna. So, okay. Maybe there's five species of monotreme. But anyway. Two yeah. Two living members of that weird, wonderful lineage. We maybe, call maybe the five. study of branching evolutionary histories like these phylogeny. Understanding yeah. helps us paint a picture of our pal the platypus, like who their ancestors were, and why they look so distinguished today. And beyond that, phylogeny helps us understand all kinds of lineages to make sense of life's big, whopping family. Hi, I'm Dr. Sammy, your friendly neighborhood entomologist, and this is Crash Course Biology. <sighs> I'm, so, I'm sorry, I, just, I didn't get enough theme music last night. <laughs> It's a really well produced series here. Very Life polished. The extended family is full of second cousins you've never met and great uncles twice removed. Nobody's wearing name tags. And Are there sea no jellies in there? There's no encyclopedic memory to tell us how we're related. Cool. But we humans make and share knowledge about the world by naming and categorizing stuff. Whether and Lobster Chung, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. That's movie genres, art styles, uh, or types of burritos. We slap name tags on life's diversity through taxonomy. We Systems talked about this yesterday, too. Categorizing organisms. Uh, for over 250 years, biologists have largely used the Linnaean system of classification. It files living things into groups called taxa, based on observable traits that they share. Yep. The, sorting the, the single singular of taxa is taxon. So, like, one taxon, multiple taxa. Uh, if you ever hear me using that term, that's that's what that means. It's just, you know, uh, a, it's a group of critters that, that uh, they are grouped together, I guess, because they share a common ancestor. So it could be as broad as a kingdom or as small as a species or even a subspecies, uh, it, you know, a taxon. And then multiple taxa, it's just multiple. You know? Things are basically a yeah. bunch of nested boxes. You could just notice. Goes in genus, <laughs> genus and family, family and order, and so on. But these taxonomic boxes are kind of subjective. Boxes like genus or family, for example, can be very broad or very specific, depending on when in history they were coined. I mean, there is literally one family France. More than 12,000 species. That's nuts. Pieces, but just one family. We should ask Belint about this. Like, I'm sure it's true. But that's wild. 12,000 species in one family. How many genera is that? 
I mean, let's look it up, actually. Um, ants. In the family Formicidae. Formicidae. Holy cow. Um, how many genera? List of ant genera. Uh, this is a shorter list than I thought it was going to be. That's not that many genera. Well, this is a long page, I suppose, but... Okay, you know what? That is, that is a lot of... That is a lot of genera. We're not even halfway down yet. Yeah, how are all of these in the same in the same family? That's nuts. That is nuts. Oh, and then we're getting into the references. But yeah. Interesting. Um so yeah, this as opposed to there are multiple families of of critters uh from other groups where the family is just one genus and just one species. Um yeah. Yeah. Whose idea was that? And because Linnaean taxonomy often relies on physical traits to sort organisms, it can miss other less visible markers of relationship between species. Enter system. Yeah. Science of yeah. categorizing organisms based on their phylogeny, that fancy word for evolutionary history. Unlike Linnaean taxonomy, which rested on how we humans historically Dragon, yeah. named things, five big cats or something. Systematics yeah. works to uncover more objective data about how species are related. Biologists construct phylogenies by comparing the anatomy and DNA of different organisms. For example, yep. sometimes organisms have common features because of shared ancestry, called homologous traits. Yep. Homologous comes from the Greek homologos, which means consistent. And with homologous traits, you see a consistency in the evolutionary blueprint. Like, So these are like true similarities. Homologous traits are ones where like, those are actually the same thing. They didn't arise because of analogy. They're not analogous traits. They didn't arise because of convergent evolution. They are the same because they both inherited that from their ancestor. That's a homologous trait. If a horse, a bat, and you walked into an x-ray machine, and, and no, this is not the setup for a terrible joke, you find the same basic bone structure in your arm, the horse's front legs, and the yep. bat's wing. Different arrangement? Same hand-me-downs from a common ancestor. But if you put a bird and a dragonfly in there, you'd see different. that their wings yep. aren't made from the same stuff. They have totally different evolutionary origins. And so wings between those organisms are not homologous structures. But it's mm -hmm. not always that simple to determine how organisms are related. Giant pandas also share their basic arm bone structure with us, plus a thumb-like appendage. So you might look at a panda's paw and think, boom, Samesies, we're close relatives. And while our thumbs do perform similar jobs, like firmly grasping snacks, our jointed thumb consists of several bones. A panda's thumb is actually a single wrist bone that evolved into a lengthened... Weird, bone. right? So Very cool. So analogous traits. They look similar, but evolved... It's convergent into evolution. Different. It's also yeah. why pandas can't play video games. So in addition to comparing physical similarities, biologists will use genetic similarities to construct phylogenies. This is based on the hypothesis that life runs on a roughly regular molecular clock, meaning DNA and protein sequences have evolved at a relatively constant rate over time. Which is a... It is a big assumption, um, but like the longer you go, Sometimes the less of an assumption it becomes because things just kind of even out over a longer span of time. But yeah, yeah. And we watched, we did watch this yesterday, but we didn't, we got to maybe this point and then we got onto other things, Bacchiotomy. So we're, uh, we're continuing this today. We're just catching up here. Yeah. Yeah. So theoretically, the more genetically different two species are, the more time has passed since their most recent common ancestor. 
some models assume that the rate of change varies across time and organism. Yeah, no worries, but back average you're good. to a fairly steady rhythm. Yeah. Other models assume that the rate has evolved in step with other traits, like the rate at which an organism metabolizes its food. But either way, the point is we can compare apples and oranges, genetically anyway. Now, yeah, and uh, I'm not sure my crab rangoon would actually be cat rangoon. Basil, no, I, this is just an example. Where, like, you could put literally any animal right here, and the house cat and the tiger are going to be more closely related than to this. Unless this is, like, a, I don't know, a palace cat or something like that, or a, some cat that's close, more closely related. Um, shoot, if you had a lion right here, then the lion and the tiger, they would be grouped together, and the cat would be the outgroup. But here, the crab is the outgroup, because it's not, you know, these two are much closer relatives than this one. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. The point is, we can compare apples and oranges, genetically anyway. Now, some genetic differences arise from natural selection, because they're traits that lend an advantage or disadvantage as an organism evolves. But there others... The emotional support button, how are you doing? Random chance. You were the line, yes. Let's pay a visit to the theater of life. Even as a kid, Japanese biologist and geneticist Dr. Moto Kimura wasn't afraid of thinking differently. He was outspoken, brimming with questions, even when they rubbed his teachers the wrong way. So it's no surprise that Kimura went on to ask a really big question in 1968. I'm not familiar with this. Evolution isn't entirely about survival of the fittest, but also survival of the lucky. Complex math yeah. led Kimura to suspect most genetic changes are random. Oh, and genetic drift, they don't yeah. Whether the organism does better or worse in their environment. He called yep. this idea neutral theory and argued that sheer chance had a bigger effect on evolution than natural selection. This it depends. was very different yeah. from what Charles Darwin had proposed and how most biologists thought evolution worked. So it didn't go over well at first, but Kimura defended the idea with dogged determination. And by challenging one of Darwin's basic ideas, Kimura refined our understanding of evolution. He showed yep. us random chance does play a role, a role so big that it's now typically assumed to be the reason for a genetic change, unless we have strong evidence for selection. He even won the Darwin Medal for his efforts, the first <laughs> Asian biologist to receive the esteemed award. And one of his most vocal critics presented it to him with a smile, because even when <laughs> biologists don't agree on everything, we often delight in the discussion and in growing our knowledge of life. This is how science is supposed to work, you know? I mean, you might be completely wrong about an idea. You could have some sort of idea that you're really, really emotionally attached to, and someone demonstrates that it's false. And, you know, that might be a little bit disappointing at first, but shoot, it's actually really cool in the long run because we're learning how the world actually works. You know, we're learning what the truth actually is. That is what is important to a scientist. Yeah. Don't agree on everything. We and all there you go, placebo. Yeah. Oh and boy. In growing our knowledge of life, <laughs> biologists today still debate Kimura's ideas and apply them to inform their understanding of the phylogenies of different species. And yeah. these are often visualized with phylogenetic trees. These nifty diagrams were created way back in the middle of the 1800s and popularized by Charles Darwin. They represent hypotheses about organisms' ancestry, including how groups have diverged or grown apart, and who's most closely related to whom. Like, you might not expect a tiny canary and a toothy crocodile to have much in common. Oh, but they do. They are both archosaurs. Yeah. Um... That canary is more closely related to that crocodile than that crocodile is to a lizard. And you might be thinking, well, that's crazy, Danny. Both, you know, crocodiles and lizards are, are reptiles. Birds are not reptiles. No, birds are reptiles. They are. Shoot. We go back to our tree of life here. Let's go to Archosauria. Yeah. So first, this is what might be commonly called reptiles. Seropsids. This group includes lizards and snakes and turtles, crocodilians, and birds. Birds are a kind of reptile. 
is birds are a kind of dinosaur, and dinosaurs are a kind of reptile. Now here, birds, turtles, and crocodilians, Archelio Archelosauria. And then birds and crocodilians, Archosauria. Dinosaurs are also part of this group, but this tree only really shows living animals. So the non-bird dinosaurs are not included on this. So yeah. Yeah. Um. But yeah, yeah. And bee burgers. Oh, we haven't talked about the giant amphibian yet. No. We will uh we will talk to talk about that in a bit. We're gonna finish this video first. But yeah, canaries are indeed a kind of reptile. They're a kind of archosaur. They're closely related. In the grand scheme of things, they're closely related to crocodilians. You might not expect a tiny canary and a toothy crocodile to have much in common, but there are lots of traits that connect them. For starters, yeah. birds and crocs both have a four-chambered heart. They also both build nests, keep their yeah. eggs warm, and sing. I mean, to be fair, a crocodile's song is more like a yell, but just like canaries, it uses its voice to croon to lovers and tell competitors, back off! And none of But... Yeah, we're lucky that none of these are a coincidence, but sometimes when you're using traits like this to try and, and link different animals, like, I don't know, you could also come up with different traits that, like, a bat and a bird have in common, even though they are not closely related. A bird is way more closely related to a crocodilian than it is to a bat. Um, so you got to be careful about which traits you pick, you know? Yeah. And none of this is a coincidence. It's because birds and crocs are each other's closest living kin. And yep. you can see this relationship illustrated on a phylogenetic tree. Evolution yeah, good stuff. Fairly speaking, crocs are closer to birds than they are to other reptiles like lizards or snakes. Mm -hmm. And whatever traits birds and crocodiles share, it's likely that their most recent common ancestor and other descendants of it had those traits too, including yep. dinosaurs. This is what we call the extant phylogenetic bracket. Let's, let's repeat that real quick. Yeah. Whatever traits birds and crocodiles share, it's likely that their most recent common ancestor had those too. Common ancestor and other descendants of it had those traits too. So yeah, this is what we call the EPB, and I bring this up all the time. The extant phylogenetic bracket. If there's something that we don't know about dinosaurs that we want to figure out, like, uh, I don't know. Could they, did they have full color vision? Or what kind of, like, soft reproductive organs did they have or whatever stuff that doesn't fossilize how do we garner clues about that in a way that's actually scientific well we can make reasoned inferences about it by using the extant phylogenetic bracket you look at their closest living relatives you look at what's known about birds who are living dinosaurs and crocodilians who were like cousins to the dinosaurs and we know stuff about them we know stuff about them so we can use that to try and organize our thoughts about dinosaurs. You're never going to get a 100% concrete answer about that necessarily, but it helps you organize your thoughts. It helps you make inferences that are hopefully closer to the real thing. You know? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. B Burger says, fun reminder that we're only one mutation away from flying crocodiles? Wait, what? Um. Yeah. Anyway, it, it would take a lot of mutations to make crocodilians fly. Holy cow. Uh, for one thing, they don't have feathers or skin membranes. Including dinosaurs. Yeah. Now, we're probably not going to find fossilized dinosaur hearts or vocal recordings to confirm this, but we do have fossils of nest building, egg protecting, feathered dinos, and a pretty strong hypothesis. So let's yep. learn to read one of these puppies. Take the phylogeny of the eight species of bear. Nice. Oh man, I wish Claire Burr were here to see this. This is right up her alley. Or branch represents a distinct lineage. Polar bears sit at the tip of this branch, and brown bears at the tip of this one. Their branches connect at this little joint, or node, representing their most recent shared ancestor. Yep. Look at that node is an... And Claire Burr, you did just... Oh, you're good, you're good. I'm just glad you're here for this, Claire. This is, uh... 
Like I said, this is right up your alley. Yeah. And brown bears at the tip of this one. Their branches connect at this little joint or node, representing their most recent shared ancestor. Think yeah. of that node as an ancient population of bears that were neither polar nor brown bear, but the latest ancestor of both species. We don't necessarily yep. know exactly who they were or what they looked like, so they're not pictured here, just represented by this little node. And this makes sense. Brown bears and polar bears can actually interbreed nowadays, and I think their offspring might even be fertile. Um, so we know that they're each other's most, you know, th they're sister taxa. They are each other's closest living relative. Brown bears and polar bears are what's considered sister taxa. That is, yep. two descendants of a shared ancestor. What I tell you. If we imagine slicing uh, off their little chunk of the tree, we can think of them as a clade, a group including yep. the ancestor and all of its descendants. Man, this is this is a great... It's so chock full of information. Holy cow. So many core concepts in this. This is like fund, absolutely fundamental stuff for biology, you know? Like, without understanding this, you cannot understand biology. Zoom out, and we can group organisms in broader clades. Like, yeah. snipping at this node groups brown bears and polar bears with four other bears and their more distant common ancestor. Uh, Oops, Caput says, I had no idea that giant pandas were so distant from brown bears. Yeah, they are. That's why, for a long time, we weren't even sure that giant pandas were bears. Sometimes they would get lumped in with red pandas, um, like in a different part of the the carnivorous family tree. Sometimes they'd get lumped in with with raccoons. But I think it was in like the eighties or nineties, genetic information showed that like nope, they are bears. They are much more closely related to bears like these than they are to raccoons or or red pandas. You know. Yeah. And don't pandas have thumbs? Oh, Hannies, it's good to have you here. We just talked about that a minute ago. Let's see, we're at 929 there. Uh, pandas don't have a, a true thumb? Yeah. It's simple to determine how organisms are related. They've got a and wrist bone. Also share their basic arm bone that protrudes. Plus a sixth a digit. Like appendage. So yep. you might look at a panda's paw and think, boom, samesies, we're close relatives. And while our thumbs do perform similar jobs, like firmly grasping snacks, our jointed thumb consists of several bones. A yeah, it's a different structure. Thumb is actually a single wrist bone that evolved into a lengthened hook. It's really weird. Like, so they've got five digits. That's their actual thumb right there. Digit one on the hand. Two, three, four, digit five. So that's their pinky. That's their thumb. That's their index finger. This is a wrist bone over here that's their thumb, which is pretty weird and cool. Uh, yeah, you can kind of see it there. It's, it's a bone that sticks out of their wrist. It's really strange. It's really weird and cool. Yeah, it's hard to find good photos of it, honestly. Um, that'll work. With some helpful red arrows there. Ugh, we're on Reddit. Why do we have all these? It's difficult to view. But there you go. Yeah. Pretty cool. I want to just do open image in a new tab, and Reddit won't let you. It's really annoying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, pretty cool, right? Anyway, back to our bear phylogeny here. And if we go back in time even further, we find a more distant ancestor, and we add spectacled bears to the mix. New clade alert, and still deeper in the past, giant pandas split away from the other bears, forming a weird little branch all their own. But yep. they're still within that big bear clade by the name of Ursidae, because they descended from the same yeah. bearish ancestor as the others. Giant pandas and red pandas, you might notice, go by a similar common name and sit near each other on our tree. But mm -hmm. they're not each other's closest genetic relatives. The clue is the node nearest the red panda branch shared with raccoons. 
That's the most recent ancestor that red pandas share with another species. Phylogenetic trees like this one can be drawn vertically, horizontally, or even diagonally. Like this tree shows evolutionary relationships among fish, frogs, lizards, mice, and humans who all yep. have a common ancestor way back when. But we humans share an ancestor with mice more recently than with fish. So Does that make sense? To talk about with the rodents at the pet store than the goldfish. And yeah. that makes some sense. But it might come as a surprise that water-loving frogs are more closely related to people than they are to fish. And that's because frogs and fish's most recent shared ancestor lived longer ago than the shared ancestor of humans and frogs. And some of you are going like, wait, well, but aren't frogs a kind of fish? Aren't people a kind of fish? Yes, strictly speaking, yes. But when he says fish here, imagine, you know, uh, ray finned fish. Ray finned fish are a group of fishes that, uh, they're not Sarcopterygian fish. Ray finned fish. Um, well, I can just scroll out here. Birds, turtles, and crocodilians, sauropsids, amniotes, tetrapods, lung fishes, and tetrapods. Lobe finned fishes, including tetrapods. That's why all of these critters are fish. They are lobe finned fish. You get to the bony vertebrates. And then you have the ray finned fish over here. So we are not ray finned fish. We are lobe finned fish. So in this case, when he says fish, imagine he's saying ray finned fish. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um. Yeah. To people than they are to fish. And that's because frogs and fish's most recent shared ancestor lived longer ago than the shared ancestor of humans and frogs. And Diagonal says fish whose fins have rays in the fins as opposed to sharks and rays whose fins are flesh. Well, uh, well, it's almost a little confusing, Diagonal, because those are cartilaginous fishes, the, ost or the uh, elasmobranch fishes. So they are over here. They're even more distantly related. Go up here, and you get to the chondrichthians. Cartilaginous fishes. Um, I don't know. When I hear fleshy fins, I immediately think sarcopterygii. The lobe fin fishes. Yeah. And then Ray finds fish. Got it. Yeah, exactly, Psychonalis. Yeah. Is the lobus became the arms? Exactly, Hannies. Exactly. Dude, we go back to here. Call back. Darwin boldly predicted that there must have been ancient animals, transitional forms that bridged this gap. Yep. But what would such an animal look like? Would it have limbs, or fins, or both? Such a creature reflects a critical step in the origin of the human hand. I set out to find one. Really cool documentary here called Your Inner Fish with Neil Shubin. I started my search back in the early 90s. Again, here is a link to that. Um, yeah, might as well go all the way back to the eukaryotes. Yeah, there you go, Wild that Hole, with our nucleated cells. But yeah. And beyond telling us how organisms are related, phylogeny can also help us answer cool questions like, where did feathers come from? We see traces of feather-like yeah. appendages on dinosaurs from the Cretaceous period, and scientists believe that the first feathers this is from the Jurassic sustaining though. flight developed on a dinosaur bird ancestor a little further along the evolutionary tree. But there's yep. no hierarchy here, no ladder from primitive to advanced, no matter how far back in time we go. It's more like the deeper we look back at the phylogenetic tree of the bears, the more unbear-like their ancestors were. Or yeah. maybe it's that bears became less bacteria-like. No judgment from me either way, because there's no top dog or, or bear in evolution. Just yep. many different ways of accomplishing survival. So phylogenetic trees represent hypotheses about how those ways of living evolved. And they are regularly thank updated you, when scientists I appreciate make you. new thank connections. You, thank you. Meanwhile, life as always is more complicated than we can ever truly capture. For example, yeah. these branches aren't as distinct as they seem. Some closely related branches can... And Beeberger says, wait, the bears are fish too? So every animal with bones is is a fish, Beebergers. 
Yeah. Aquatic water breathing bears? My god, they're so stopping them now. Well, that's a different kind of creature that's not... And it doesn't have anything to do with bears. But there's another creature called a tardigrade, sometimes called water bears. That is a, a totally different kind of of animal. Um, yeah, shoot, let me find that. Uh, water bears. There we go. What is a water bear? <laughs> it's not a bear. This is a tardigrade. They're tiny animals that grow up to one millimeter long and have yep. eight legs. They're also known as water bears. Their feet look like this, more like claws. And up close, yeah. their faces look like this. Some speculate that there are around 900 known species. They were wow. given the name tardigrata by Italian biologist Lazzaro Spallanzani. They're also known <laughs> as moss piglets. They typically <laughs> live around water in damp moss or lichen. But they're not bears and they're not piglets. Um, but yeah, when tardigrades become bear size, so that's an idea I had for a monster movie a long time ago, HD, you know, like a, a Godzilla style movie with a, you know, a skyscraper sized tardigrade that attacks Seattle and eats the space needle. Uh, yeah, I've never seen tardigrades in a, uh, in a monster film before. I think they'd be, I think it'd be excellent. Yes. But can be found almost everywhere on earth. Some theorize they might have come from space. No. Of course, this no one thinks they came from space. Oh, goodness. They obviously did not come from space. This is not BuzzFeed multiplayer. Mm. Nobody thinks they came from this space. The theory. They can survive dry periods by curling into little balls. They can hang around like that for a hundred years before casually regenerating. Some species are carnivorous. Some might even eat other tardigrades. So, how resilient are these little guys? They can withstand 1,000 times the lethal human dose of X-ray radiation. In 2007, some tardigrades hitched a ride on a space shuttle and lived outside the spacecraft in an oxygen-deprived vacuum of space wow. for 10 days. Many Pretty survived. Cool. All of which means... Many survived, not all of them. ...means it's probably impossible to kill a tardigrade. And that's not true. Shoot. If you follow uh, or, or watch various microscopists here on Twitch. Uh, I don't know. Uh, Freckled Science. Amanda used to find tardigrades all the time. Um, Diatoms Attack. I think might find tardigrades. Pacific Plankton might. Science Streams could show you some tardigrades. A lot of them you find are dead. Like, they're not invincible. It's not impossible to kill a target. Sometimes they just, like, you can't keep them alive sometimes. <laughs> so that's 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 a misnomer. Or a, not a misnomer, that's a, a misunderstanding there. They're not invincible. Yeah. Uh, and maybe Canistall Cod. I'm not actually sure what happened with those space ones. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. You can still interbreed. Like those polar bears and brown bears that we met earlier. They've been known to mate in the wild, producing grizzly polar hybrids called pizzly or growler bears. Uh, pretty good hunters, but not strong swimmers. We see similar nice. evidence that many organisms change on a population level as a result of moving around and breeding with other populations, what's called gene flow. So it's not enough to think of life's branches as only splitting off from common ancestors, because the distinctions between branches are fuzzier than that. Branches can link back up again. Genes can also flow between species. So yep. while we often do think of life's evolutionary history sort of like a tree, it's also like a network of streams, winding and meandering as species grow apart, but sometimes find their way back together again. Constructing True. the phylogenies of different species helps us make sense of Earth's big, ongoing extended family with all of its weird and wonderful offshoots. It helps us trace connections between living things, comparing what they share and how they differ. And it helps us understand how all life evolved and visualize how deeply interconnected we are. In our next episode, we'll scope out a great view of the tree of life when we talk about biological diversity. Good stuff. See you then. Peace. This series was produced in collaboration with HHMI Biointeractive. 
If you're an editor, nice. visit biointeractive.org. We know them. They do great work. Classroom resources There's a link to this video there. Development related to the topics covered in this course. Yeah. Thanks for watching this episode of Crash Course Biology. Which oh, yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. Now, what were we going to cover after this? I forget. Um, our new giant amphibian. Bee Burgers, you still here? Yeah. This is pretty cool. We've got a new gigantic early amphibian species. Just discovered. Not just discovered, it was discovered a while ago. Just published the other day. Check this out. Yeah. I love the art here. Look at this guy. Just a big ol' honkin' head. Look at that big mouth. All of those tiny teeth. And look at that smile, yeah. <laughs> yeah! Ah. Our new critter is called... Stenocranio. Stenocranio. A new national team of researchers with participation from the Museum for Naturkunde, Berlin, it's the Natural History Museum, in the capital of Germany, they discovered a new species of early tetrapod in the Rotlagend between Kaiserslautern and Trier in western Rhineland Palatinate, Germany. The animal named Stenocranio, Greek stenos, cranio, narrow skull, uh, after its special head shape, lived almost 300 million years ago and was one of the largest predators of its time. The new species Stenocranio boldi was up to one and a half meters long, had a large flat skull with several pointed teeth, and fed on fish and other tetrapods. It is an extinct representative of the Temnospondyli, a group of amphibians that was particularly rich in species in ancient times. So this group of animals here. You might be familiar with Temnospondyls. If you've ever seen the Walking with Dinosaurs series. Uh, here, check this out. Um, yeah. And El Triha, yeah. You know Kulasukas. How many hamburgers long is it? <laughs> there you go. Ornithopod dinosaur didn't make it through the winter. Kulasukas is like, oh, all of a bit of that. Yeah. So picture basically it's it's almost like a gigantic salamander. But they're not particularly close to salamanders. Yeah, very cool. Hmm. Half a ton, I know, right, Hannies? That's more than nine American hamburgers. <laughs> it's pretty heavy. And aren't most amphibians carnivorous? Yeah, they are. Claire Brewer, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So this group of animals used to be really common. But 
but uh, and they were thought to be extinct actually before Kulasukas was discovered in Cretaceous rocks in Australia. We would thought this group went extinct long before the Cretaceous. Turns out they didn't. Not entirely. Uh... <laughs> Lenina says, my eldest called this a cockroach whale when he first watched this. Uh, <laughs> okay. That's great. Uh, and Triha, in this case, uh, no, because what you're talking about is what we call reworking. So, uh, when a sometimes fossils can be reworked. So, like the animal dies and is, you know, buried by sediments and fossilized, and then over the course of millions of years, those fossils can become unburied and then reburied in rocks that are younger. But it's pretty much only like a single bone or a tooth. And there's usually signs that it's been reworked. It's been tumbled smooth or it's been like all the sticky outy bits have been worn away, broken off. You can usually tell when something like that's been reworked. It won't happen with like an entire skeleton. So in the case of Kulasukas, how much material did we have from that animal? Yeah. Um, yeah, look at this. The holotype mandibles. We've got whole jaw bones of this animal with teeth intact. You know? So yeah. Yeah. And oh yeah, Steely Dan. <laughs> Uh, has anybody done fan art or like anything of a Kulasukas bursting through a wall like the Kool-Aid man? That would be funny. Hmm. No, I'm not seeing anything. Um, well, this is interesting. The evolution of the Kool-Aid Man. Huh. Yeah. Huh. Um. Yeah. You want to, you kind of want to do that? Casey's no more. Yeah. Good stuff. Anyway, Kulasugas, a neat animal. This is not the same. Ontogeny. The reason I'm showing you this is. Ontogeny. We're, uh. Uh, evolution or ontogeny? I don't know. Is it one individual or is it multiple generations HD? I don't know. Kool-Aid Man Anagenesis says Psychanalysis. Yeah. Non-divergent evolution, perhaps. Uh, um. Anyway, yeah. Pretty cool stuff. So this is a member of Temnospondyli. Like our brand new amphibian. Was it Stenocranio? Stenocranio. So, this is a much, much earlier Temnospondyl when these guys were still some of the biggest predators around. They were still common in their environments. Uh, uh, long before the emergence of crocodiles, the amphibian Stenocranio lived as a lurking hunter in and on the edge of tropical waters. In terms of body shape and lifestyle, the animal occupied a similar ecological niche as the later crocodilians. Although it was much more closely related to extant frogs and salamanders than the crocodiles. Yeah. It's not a reptile. And it's not a tetrapod. 
Or no, it is a tetrapod. It's not an amniote. Sorry. Um, yeah. Crocodilians are amniotes. They lay eggs on land, not in the water, like amphibians do. This critter would have laid its eggs in the water, presumably. Oh. Pretty cool. It's estimated that Senecranio could grow up to 1.5 meters long. Ooh. That's like close to five feet. Its closest relative, Ariops, from the UEPS, reached skull lengths of up to 60 centimeters and body lengths of up to three meters. Um, wow. Okay, so it's smaller than Ariops. Yeah. This is cool stuff. Let's, uh... See if we can get access to the original paper. Uh, oh, first, I'll give you this link here. Yeah. There we go. And unfortunately, this is not open access. It's paywalled. But yeah. Yeah. So it's not a house pet. No, definitely not HD. But if you have a big pond, it's also unfortunately extinct. Um, so maybe it would be a, a good pet. Well, no. It would not make a good pet because, again, what is the proper habitat for this animal nowadays? That belongs in a museum! Yeah. Not in your pond. <laughs> yeah. And El Trija, there are sites like that, but they usually don't work until somebody has put them on there. This paper's too new for that. Oh. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is Devonian or Carboniferous? I think it might even be early... Per it might be Permian, El Trija. Yeah, from the Camp Carboniferous Permian boundary. Yeah. Uh, cool stuff. Its semi aquatic lifestyle enabled Stenocranio to browse riverbanks and lake shorelines for prey, but most likely it fed on aquatic vertebrates. Probably fishes and maybe other smaller tetrapods. Yeah. Cool stuff. Cool stuff. Neat animal. Yeah. Uh, but if you get a 3D print of it, that'll make a good house pet. Just needs dusting occasionally. There you go, Charlie's Dragon. There you go. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. Cool stuff. And Eldria says, what was the early Permian like before everything went desert, like we see in Walking with Monsters? How did the environment change from Carboniferous to Permian? Um, the Carboniferous, I think... My impression of the Carboniferous is that it's largely warm, tropical, and wet. But I'm sure it's much more nuanced than that. I'm sure... Yeah. I know... When I see... Uh, illustrations of like uh, of like Dimetrodon and Diadectes going at it. It's usually in like a fairly wet environment. Kind of swampy or uh, there's a lot of water near shore. Yeah. But I, I'm not absolutely certain. Um, all of these are going to be fairly lo localized to a certain extent, too. Like, when you've got desertification of stuff, you know, like during the late Triassic. Uh, or the mid-Triassic. Like, that wasn't everywhere on Earth was desert. You still would have had a lot of vegetation near the coasts, near rivers and lakes and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think the Permian turned into a desert because all the continents bunched up. So no, yeah, you had massive continental climate at that time. But there still would have been oases here and there. 
Here, let me show you what Earth would have looked like around that time. Say, 240 million years ago. All of Earth's continents were all bunched together. This is, like, middle Triassic, but let's go back further. Let's try 280 million years ago. Yeah. Quite bunched up that much. 260. Yeah, really, it's like the Triassic that Pangea is in full swing. And there would have been big deserts across here at the time. But I think it's kind of up for debate how much desert there was. How dry it actually was. You know? That said, there is a really, really cool series on Netflix that came out not too long ago that talks about all this stuff, and if anybody's not yet seen it, I would highly recommend it. If you have Netflix, watch this. There we go. Life on our planet. It is excellent. I haven't actually gotten to this part yet. Or have I? No, I have. Yeah. This is the story of the great battles of survival. And you know that voice. Yeah. It's, uh, it's none other. Then, uh, Gordon Freeman, the man with the golden voice from the, um, Halo games, right? Yeah. Right? <laughs> that would take over the world. Lambda Man, there you go, HD, yeah. To today. Yeah. I've actually been really impressed with this series. The creature designs aren't the best I've ever seen. But the narrative structure is really good, and I love that it actually takes you through the history of life on Earth. In a really engaging way, it keeps flashing forward to the present to show you examples of what they call dynasties. These different lineages. Uh... Oh, look at the Deinonychus. This is the story of life on our planet. Yeah. Good stuff. Um, so if you if you have Netflix, check it out. It's I'm really really glad that this exists. Watching this, there's like there's things I would quibble with, like oh the creature would probably look a little bit different from that. I would make these more brightly colored. I'd make their behavior a little bit less human like, etc. 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 I would focus on different things. I'd change details. But I kind of realized that, like, it's not for me, you know? The really cool thing about this, and the thing that I think this documentary has done better than anything else up until this point, is just showing the, the progression of the, the history of life on Earth and telling it like a narrative story. You know, it kind of gives you characters to root for. And it draws parallels to the present day to try and make things relevant to everybody watching. And in doing that, it's just... It's very, very watchable. And, uh... I'm impressed with it. I'm impressed with it. Some of these people aren't? Why life on our planet failed? What does this person have to say? If my 50 minutes long review consisting almost entirely of praise didn't make it abundantly clear already, I have a very high opinion of the recent paleo documentary series Prehistoric Planet. 
Yeah, that's pretty good. Really good. Oh, the Triceratops were not good, though. documentary that would, or so I thought at the time, give prehistoric planet some serious competition. I'm talking about the Netflix series Life on Our Planet. Anyway, it's a much, much broader scope. I mean, it's comparing apples and oranges, you know? Uh, I don't know. I thought Life on Our Planet was pretty stellar. And uh, and what is this? Life on Our Planet filming the dinosaurs in the real world. This looks cool. What's a little unusual about Life on Our Planet is that we have natural history, like real animals shot in the wild. Yeah. Incredible behaviors sitting right next to prehistoric monsters, dinosaurs, crazy creatures from the past. I've been lucky enough to film many of the greatest predators alive today, wolves, tigers, leopards. So it was an amazing opportunity to try and use the same techniques of filming to tell stories about T-Rex and raptors and all these different creatures. Uh, yeah, Claire Burt, yeah. I'm not gonna be like, well, don't call them monsters, call them animals, because, you know, sometimes we, as scientists, use that term as well. It's like, if you're trying to communicate with the public, you know, yeah, I don't know. It's, I'm not, I'm not going to get, yeah, critters, I often say critters, yeah. But I'm not going to get too up in arms about that. For me, the sequence that really shows off the accuracy, the cinematography, and just the, the, the story of Life on Ooh, Our Planet is the Platysaurus egg hatching. Yeah. Nice. Hey, reanimated so bit. Welcome, welcome. It's a simple welcome. scene, and yet it had a lot of roles to do. Yeah. Because also, it's the first time you meet dinosaurs properly in the series. That's got to be epic. I really loved this sequence. I thought it was awesome. I wanted to shoot this in, like, the wilds of Canada or Nova Scotia or, I don't know, somewhere spectacular. COVID put an end to that. But we chose the Lake District because it's gorgeous. In Scotland, right? Or Northern England? We're here to do... Well, super high-tech VFX sequence, and so we've got all the toys. Wheelbarrows. Northern England. Okay, good one. thank you. That was oh, the boy, thing they I do have all the toys. This project. They were like, oh, it must be really boring filming backplates, but I don't see it as that. I see it as we're filming a very complex, dynamic behavioral sequence. We're imagining the creatures, which I enjoy doing. I don't have any problem imagining a T-Rex running through the forest. And so... <laughs> Translating that and doing something that no one had done before, which is to film dynamic natural history style shots of these creatures. Yeah. The landscape is really <laughs> exciting and a really good challenge. And yeah, great fun. Best fun I've ever had. Throughout visual effects, there's a point at which you're filming nothing. Amazing. And you have to get. Gain... dinosaur eggs. And they're perfect. Alma? Mm -hmm. Cool. Hey, Danny and Co. Nice to see you have gone from 50 ish viewer to this during your career. Keep it up, pal, yoke up. Thank you, thank you, Kalma. I really appreciate that. And thank you for the 20 months of support. That is exquisite. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean... Nowhere to go but up from here. Well, I suppose that's not strictly speaking true, but... Big plans for the future, Kalma. Big plans for the future. Thank you for, uh, helping us get there. Holy cow. Yeah, 20 months is a long time. It really is. Uh. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, good stuff. Good stuff. Let's continue here. Into a certain mindset with that. And you have to be on board with the DOP and the director producer to understand how that is going to work luckily jamie has spent years <laughs> there you go diagonal lots of beautiful plants exactly good handle on what they might do well in this scene we've got a huge dinosaur eight meters long and a tiny dinosaur 10 centimeters high so we to work out what lenses and camera positions we're going to use we use scale models cutouts and then oops kaput says would plants look more or less the same as now during the dinosaur so very different oops kaput um a lot of the individual plants might look 
similar. Plants that you can find around the world today might look similar to plants that existed during the Age of Dinosaurs, but what the main difference is, for most of the Age of Dinosaurs, there were no flowering plants. No flowers, no oak trees, no grasses. And that is exceedingly difficult, is to like find filming locations that don't have any grass anywhere. Because there was no grass during the Age of the Dinosaurs. So yeah, yeah. Um. Oh shoot, that's not what I was trying to do. There we go. Um. Yeah, so during the Age of Dinosaurs, this would be, I guess this could be Jurassic right here. Um, there were no grasses. And so you have to find filming locations that don't have grasses. And if you can find ones that have things like tree ferns and cycads and horsetails and club mosses and spike mosses, conifer trees, things like aracaria, like monkey puzzle trees, or things like redwoods, sequoias, um, that's going to be suitable for some environments during the Age of Dinosaurs. Yeah. Um, here, let me, uh, let me show you. Mesozoic plants. I think there's a little video right here. Yeah, take a look at this. So, this is a, an arboretum or a, a greenhouse, I think somewhere in like the Czech Republic or something. Um, but you've got all of these beautiful examples of plants who have ancestors that go back to the Mesozoic. Um, well, all plants have ancestors that go back to the Mesozoic, but a lot of these don't look that different from plants that would have existed during the Mesozoic, during the age of the dinosaurs. Yeah, ferns for days, absolutely, Drew Magnified. Yes. We've also got cycads, this group of really, really cool plants that are... They're unlike anything else today. I guess their closest rel living relatives might be conifers? Um, or ginkgos? But yeah, both conifers and ginkgos also existed during the age of dinosaurs. But cycads, ferns... Big old ferns here. Big old cycads. I don't know what this kind of a tree is. Shoot, what is this right here? Diagonal, you would probably know this. What is this? I always forget this kind. Um, yeah. All these beautiful ferns here. Who is this guy, though? Back here. Big tree ferns. These might be, um, these might be, uh, these are not Dicksonia Antarctica. They're not Tasmanian tree ferns. They might be Cyathea cooperi, Australian soft tree ferns. Although I think those have been renamed recently. Uh, oh, and, uh, Pollo28, thank you. Gracias por seguirme. Y bienvenidos a Paleontologizer. Um, no, not these guys. There's, uh, it almost looks like it's not a broad leaved tree, but it's not a fern either. Shoot, maybe we'll get a better look at, like, these guys in the back with those discrete leaves like that. They're not frondy leaves like, uh, like a fern. They're, they're something else. These guys. Yeah. Got some conifers here. This almost looks like a cycad. I almost see a cone right there. Yeah. Yeah, look at that big old cone on this cycad. Gorgeous. Yeah. No, these are not palms, Dramignophyte. Absolutely. Cycads are a totally different group of plants. Palms, I think, are a kind of angiosperm, aren't they? Uh, diag uh, diagonal? Um, yeah, this is a much more ancient group of plants, the cycads. Yeah. Um, so yeah. But I know we've got one of these at Berkeley, outside the Jepsum Herbarium. Like this. It, I'm just pointing to the leaves back here behind this trunk. I know this is a tree fern. Um, 
But this is something else. I don't remember what it's called. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, El Trija says, how hard would it be to maintain a grassless Mesozoic uh, garden compared to just watering some grass seeds? Um, it's tricky to keep grasses out. And in Walking with Dinosaurs, um, there. They had a real difficult time scouting locations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to find... Oh, Pete Larson. Uh, here we go. Locations. Yeah. And yet... Again, why is it difficult? My finger on one reason it's grass grass never appeared in dinosaur times and yet grass yep. is all over this world and even when we so other series like uh when dinosaurs roamed america they just kind of they said well to heck with it we're just gonna film in environments that have grass They're like, we're not even going to bother, you know? It's too tough. So this is, again, uh, when dinosaurs roamed America. There we go. But for Walking with Dinosaurs, which came before, and really kind of, like, established the genre of, you know, uh, nature-style documentaries about extinct animals... They really did it right the first time around, partly because I think they had a much bigger budget, but it, they also felt very strongly about this. They wanted to have environments with no... Far, actually, right down here, just north of San Francisco, along the Marin Peninsula was where this was built. Right along there. Yeah. Near Muir Woods. Exactly, Claire Burr. Exactly. Yeah. Anyway, good stuff, yeah. Um, <laughs> Holy cow, Casey Snowart, you did this so fast, my goodness. It's Kulasugas, oh yeah. <laughs> that is phenomenal, holy cow. I like the Kool-Aid man, just breaking through a brick wall. Kool-Aid Asuka. <laughs> it's brilliant. Ah, oh, I gotta save that. This is fantastic. Um. Yeah, let's put that in that folder there. Uh, by Casey Snow Art. Beautiful. Oh, my goodness. I love that. Ah, that is brilliant. Um, you did this so fast. I'm astonished. Well done. Well done. Holy cow. Um, it was just a funny prompt. It's extraordinary, Casey Snowart. If any of you are not yet following Casey Snowart, you see the kind of thing that you're missing out on? Well, picture this, but, you know... That raw level of skill, but just you know, depicting living animals for the most part. I saw Casey Snowart do some sketches of of lions just the other day and it is you know, like could easily get published in a, a book, these illustrations. Excellent. This is meant to be quick and goofy and fun. You should see Casey's other art. It's still fun, but man is it impressive. Go give her a follow. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Kool-Aid Zookas. There you go, Logan. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. 
Um, well, you definitely gave us a giggle. And uh, with your permission, Casey Snowart, I'd like to put that in a, a cold open video. I want to do like a collection of uh, different bits of art from the community, especially like fan art and stuff like that, stuff related to paleontologizing. Uh, I'm eventually going to be putting together a, a, a cold open video uh, for the beginning of stream with a bunch of those. So if it's okay with you, can I, can I put it in there? It's going to be like an art gallery walkthrough kind of a deal. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Uh, I wish just no, you, if you want, you can touch it up and, and send me another one, but this is great as it is. You know, I love it. It's really good. Yeah. Yeah. Let's continue with this now for, uh, for life on our planet. And uh, how did they film dinosaurs in these locations? You see there's grass back here, but they... I was looking closely, too. I didn't see it. No grass jumped out at me while I was watching this. I've been really impressed with uh, with how they handled this. So we to work out what lenses and camera positions we're going to use, we use scale models, cutouts, and then huge rulers to show, show us how big it needs to be and where we need to put the camera. Yeah. Uh. What we're filming are really, really tiny. They're only 30 by about nice 10 kiss. centimeters. Yeah. So yeah. to help with them um, getting them in shot and kind of visualizing them, we've got these really amazing little cardboard ones. <laughs> we're just going to pop them in shot so we can make sure everything looks good and they're all lined up properly. Smile. <laughs> okay, so if we get shot 140. Terrible smile. Remember when they leave the <laughs> nest, there's a point where we want them to go from being on all fours to taking those sort of little steps up into bipedal. Yeah. The location VFX is 90% gardening because you have to remove grass, you have to tidy it up, you have to like sort the scene out to make it all work. Basically, all those twigs this side behind them need to come out. <laughs> all in <a> day's work. <laughs> what you realize, the reason that that forest floor is covered in the most beautiful moss and lichen is because it's wet. Yeah. Oh boy. We had 10 days and it rained and then it rained a bit more and then it was cloudy and then it rained some more jamie and i came here <laughs> a couple of weeks ago and it was the most sort of heavenly magical little spot we were like it's gonna be perfect not today oh boy genuine sun right by the time we get it all out the sun will be gone again but you know there's hope here we go sun 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 quickly quick on pre-roll oh, <laughs> it's, oh gone. it's gone it's genuinely, it's gone. genuinely gone look at that <laughs> so we're all waiting there, staring up at the sky, clouds going past, going, come on, come on, come on. And then the sun would come out, and you press go, and the sun go in again, you go, oh. Did anyone look at the forecast? Hmm? I did. It's supposed to be getting better this afternoon. <laughs> I can't help but laugh, we'll but. see. <laughs> so we usually use pre-roll to capture animals doing strange behaviors that you can't predict so you go on pre-roll and basically it records the first few seconds before you hit the button never had to do it for a board and slate <laughs> out. coming i'd say the shooting is probably the most intense part because you've got to find all 30 35 shots very quickly and work out the light and all those things so it's a really big challenge there you go real man yeah it all comes together north of england rainy rainy Throughout that entire 10 day period, the sun came out, I think for about an hour in total, and we shot the entire <laughs> sequence in those moments. Next. <laughs> Next shot. One cool. shot every four hours. Yeah. You find yourself doing the most ludicrous things. Are you ready, Barney? The lovely blue gloves. The lovely strange blue gloves. Blue's a color that isn't often found in the natural world, so you can get rid of it or the wizards at ILM can. Definitely one, one of those, yeah, that will work quite well. It's a nice deal on the edge. Basically, I had to wear blue gloves to pretend to be the mouth of the animal eating. Platyosaurus, yeah. Channeling it in a platyosaurus. <laughs> yeah. Let it settle. <laughs> Effectively yank the branch as if we were the platyosaurus eating that branch. And, <laughs> and that's what's in the show afterwards. That's what goes in and then we animate the head of the platyo to match what uh, we did with our hand when we were putting yeah. this thing down. After you filmed it. Very nice. And by the way, Platyosaurus here. 
is one of the dinosaurs that I was working on this weekend. And, uh, well, shoot, let me show you. Um, it's not painted yet, but it will be painted soon. I printed this ages ago. Life-size Platyosaurus fossil here, complete with matrix. But uh, filled in a bunch of the gaps with water putty. And then put smoothing compound over the top to get rid of a bunch of the print lines. And I will be painting this after. So it should look. It should look like this. Um, that's the specimen right there. Yeah, it'll look like this when it's done. So, I'm excited about that. Yeah. And that'll be a really nice addition to the office here. Another addition to the Paleo Menagerie here. On paleontologizing this lovely creature, Platyosaurus. Uh, we did with our hand when we were putting those things down. After you filmed it, so it's a very... You know, it's a very collaborative process with ILM to bring those creatures to life and make sure that the camera's working and the positions are right and that it all sort of feels fluid and natural and that they're embedded in that environment. But the first person to touch anything is, is Corinne, who works in what we call layout department. So the plateau sequence is my favourite sequence. Um, hmm. Firstly, because it's incredibly cute. It is very also, cute. So it's one of those sequences that really shows the kind of work that we do in layout. What we do is we take the set photos and we use these photos to create a replica of the real world environment that we filmed in. So mm. then we can put our dinosaurs and our other creatures in that world and they're all perfectly aligned and they look like they live there. Sean actually models them. Holy and cow. Effectively paints it. Beautiful. And that gets brought in for animation by Sawan. My job as an animator is to bring these creatures to life. Um, that involves making them walk, making them move, and we wanted to convey a level of cuteness. So <laughs> there was a lot, a lot of little twitching, you know, little cute head angles and, and big eyes, lots of big pupils, um, just to try and make them look as innocent and as cute as we could. <laughs> so once Salman has finished his animation, and you know where the little Platio's footsteps are going, uh, Phil then... And Casey Snart says, so, uh... We don't like the dino animation in this series, but the science is good. I'll resist the urge to draw from it if it's badly modeled. No, the, the models are pretty good for the most part. I would have changed some of the coloring and stuff like that. But shoot, I would change most of the coloring in Prehistoric Planet, too. Even though the models in that were pretty exquisite. Um, Utah Raptor is the most dangerous dinosaur around. So adorable. Oh, thank you, Varmin. Oh, you mean... You mean the dinosaurs. Varman, I appreciate you. 38 months of support. Holy cow. That is a long time. And I really appreciate it, Varman. Holy moly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah. The So I, th I thought the colors were a little drab, Casey Snow Art, but I often think that about dinosaur depictions. Um, yeah, I think the the models are, for the most part, pretty good for this series. I like them a lot. Uh, but not just the dinosaurs, but, like, a lot of the other animals, too. They almost feel just a little bit too human in their in their emotions, in their movements. Um, and, like, the way that their eyes look and stuff. Like, they're a little, they're a little cutesy. But you know what? That's okay. Because... This is on Netflix, and this is seeing, like, wide release to everybody who has Netflix. And so you've got to cater to, like, as broad an audience as possible. And so you might have to give the critters a little bit more almost human-like personality than, uh, than somebody like me would, would have thought to do. So I kind of understand that, you know? They're slightly anthropomorphized in their behaviors and their movements. And the way their eyes look around and everything. But, again, 
you're trying to appeal to as broad an audience as possible. You know, everybody who has Netflix. That's, you know, your Uncle Joe. It's the abuela down the street. It's the, you know, postal worker who delivers your mail. It's everyone, you know? It's not just paleontologists. So yeah, yeah. Um, and Horns fan says, when, also when we're fighting against the people who don't want evolution in schools, probably can't quibble over big people. Exactly, Horns fan, exactly. That's the thing, is that this series actually depicts the history of life on our planet through evolution. And so you're already kind of fighting an uphill battle. I think the more it can appeal to a wide audience, the better. They're fighting the good fight here. You know, they're showing people actual good science. So of course, it's, you know, it's not intended to be as, as studiously accurate and, you know, maybe dry. <laughs> somebody like me would like, you know, where I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. It's good that the animals are cute, you know? Yeah. Kind of irritated. Yeah, I know Casey Snower, but it's, again, it's on Netflix. So like, I kind of understand that they cute, they cutesy things up a little bit and anthropomorphize the critters a little bit. Charlie's Dragon says, it's not a university course, it's entertainment. But that's the cool thing is... It is, like... It's not like the science in it is bad. It's really good for the most part. I mean, holy cow. You could watch this in a university class, and it would it should be able to fit right in. You know, it'll be very entertaining, and it's a little, it's a little bit cutesy, but... It's really well done, you know? So yeah, yeah. And the wild thing is, most people are not getting this kind of an education in school, at least here in the US. They're not learning about the history of Earth and the history of life on our planet. This is called Life on Our Planet. It's about the history of life on our planet. And it shows that really, really well. And actually uses really good scientific information in it. So I'm, I'm really happy about it, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. And Shazio says, wish they would use authentic camera footage from the time instead of trying to remake it. <laughs> Very funny, Shazio. But that's the thing is they do a ton of that also. It, it flashes forward to the present a bunch of times and you've got real footage of real organisms in the modern day too. And so that's, they're really making things... They're setting the bar so high for themselves because they've got all these scenes with dinosaurs, with giant orthocones, and with trilobites, and with gorgonopsians and stuff. And that has to coexist alongside actual footage of real animals from today. From the modern day. And it's got to be more or less seamless across those. It's really difficult to pull off, and they managed to do it. So it's, it's a real accomplishment, I think. Seeds the ground, if you like, yeah. with all the things that the baby patio might stand on. That was so fun to work on. That was hmm. such a treat. It's not too often you get those kind of types of environments uh, to work with in CG. Hmm. As the dinosaur walks through, it just, based on where its like foot goes, we just push down the moss, and then we were able to kind of like bring it back up just to leave an imprint of where his dinosaur foot went. That was quite a bit of a challenge, and it's one of those things where you kind of see it and you're like, I don't know if anyone notices that we did any work on that. <laughs> like, That's so cool, really though. Really great, like sequence, and there's just so many. Dig up, dig up dinosaurs. <laughs> well, try to. Ren you try to. Six readers want to know what it's like. Ren Million, welcome to paleontologizing. How are you doing? It's good to have you here. Holy cow. I don't recognize that username. Are you new here? Streaming some art? Welcome to Paleontologizer. Shoot. Um, Red Melian, howdy, howdy. How did your stream go? Tell me all about it. I want to hear. And let me introduce myself. Hang on a second. This camera. Make sure 
There we go. That's better. Sorry. This one conks out sometimes. Welcome to Paleontologizing. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. And I'm streaming to you from my office here in the San Francisco Bay Area. As a paleontologist, I work on fossils. As a dinosaur paleontologist, I work on dinosaur fossils in particular. Dinosaurs are what I study, what I publish on, what I dig up. And uh, what I talk about here five days a week on Twitch. So, uh, yeah. Stuck in a Meow Mix ad current. Oh. Oh, we're back. Okay, good, Red Melian. I'm sorry you were stuck in an ad. At least it was an entertaining one, I hope. Did they have the Meow Mix song? That's, that's a banger, that one. Anyway, had me at dinosaurs? Welcome, Ren Melian. It's great to have you here. Yeah. Um, how did your stream go? I hope it was really, really good. Tell me about it. And, uh... Kitfish gifted a tier one sub to Ren Melian. They have given two gift subs in the channel. Thank you, Kitfish. Thank you very, very much. Excellent. Yeah. Um... Thank you for that generosity. Anyway, Red Million, I appreciate the raid. I really do. Let me know if you've got any dinosaur questions. We were looking at some behind the scenes, like a little behind the scenes featurette about uh, a Netflix series called Life on Our Planet, which is really, really good. Here, I'll show you a trailer from that. Um, I was recommending that if you have Netflix, watch it. I think you'd really like it. There. Um, oh, and it's it's narrated by uh, by Gordon Freeman himself. Yeah. Designing a coloring book. That's awesome, Red Melian. Very very cool. Really excellent series. As a paleontologist, somebody who does science outreach full time, this makes my life easier. This is the story of life on our planet. Yeah. <laughs> it's good stuff. It's really good stuff. So we were just watching this little featurette about like, you know, behind the scenes, getting the, getting the dinosaurs to actually interact with their environment in a way that is more or less seamless. So fun to know? work on. That was such a treat. It's not too often you get those kind of types of environments uh, to work with in CG. As the dinosaur walks through, it just, based on where it's like foot goes, we just push down the moss and then we were able to kind of like bring it back up just to leave a imprint of where his dinosaur foot went that was quite a bit of a challenge and it's one of those things where you kind of see it and you're like i don't know if anyone notices that we did any work on that <laughs> but it was a really great like sequence and there's just so many kind of different interaction things that just sell it so then it goes into compositing and somebody like andreas will put that scene together to make that incredible final image so the main thing of course nice. like when different elements come together if they are like backgrounds plates from sets or um, elements coming from the computer, they're not all gonna be aligned to each other. Just Check the credits for best boy footprint imprinter in any HD. Yeah. Just makes everything feel more organic and believable and brings the shots all the more to life. Gladiosaurus so are realistic, lovely. so believable, but it's really exciting. When the animal's embedded in the landscape and really feels like a real creature, I think a lot of them would be hard to tell that they're not real creatures. Life on our planet is really 
exciting project to be involved with. Having the opportunity to work with the world's best wildlife filmmakers was an amazing one. Behind the scenes work? Yeah, Ren Melian. Good stuff, on, right? Probably the most exciting project I've ever worked on, so... Yeah. Is it Ren Melian? Like it's Chameleon? Exciting. Is that the idea? Anyway, if you have Netflix, check this out. I, I haven't actually gotten through all of it yet, but I watched the primary dinosaur episode um, a couple days ago, or over the weekend. I was impressed, you know? I would have made some different... a few different choices about how to depict some of the dinosaurs. Would have made them more brightly colored. Stuff like that, but man... I really can't complain. It was it was excellent. Oh yeah, yeah. It's, it's a dinosaur. And Ren Melian, thank you for the follow. Short for the Renaissance Chameleon. I had a feeling there. Yeah, very eclectic. Well, it's good to have you here. Can I ask you what kind of coloring book you're working on? Because that sounds really exciting. And I've kind of always wanted to do a coloring book. But I'm sure it would not be nearly as, uh, as nice as yours. <laughs> Holy cow. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and good night to you, Tannerim. Thanks for being here. Yeah. You, first person to get the name pronunciation correct? I've had a lot of practice, I suppose, with unusual combinations, different prefixes and suffixes, and I'm a dinosaur paleontologist, you know? Like, I'm consistently pronouncing the Latin or Greek names of various extinct animals. I've gotten pretty good at sounding things out. Um, I'm glad somebody finally got your name right, Renmelion. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. But yeah. And Dave Karen says, I've done continuity. It's a prime example of an unnoticed job. If you do it right, yes, Dame Karen. Continuity in film is one of those things that... Man. It's underappreciated in that sense. But man, if it goes wrong, or isn't done right, then... I'm gonna wish they had somebody like you, Dame Karen. That's cool. Yeah. And I run two crows market here. Three annual mid-range juried art shows. Making a coloring book with crows! Mainly variations of the logo. Oh, very cool. Love to do a dinosaur coloring book if you ever want to collaborate. That sounds really neat, Red Malian. That sounds really neat. I have long wanted to do a dinosaur coloring book. Maybe we should talk. Yeah. Um. Yeah. As he says, the other cam needs a volume boost. It's the. It's a bug, Pezzy. I need to talk to my tech expert person about this. But the other camera, it's the exact same audio settings, copied and pasted. There's no reason at all whatsoever that it should be different. I looked at it this morning, too. Everything is 100% identical. As far as I can tell, so, yeah. Anyway, do you email me, me address? Sounds good, Redmelian. Sounds good. Yeah. Um. But yeah, yeah. Anyway. Uh, one more little video about this before we wrap up, I think. Um, designing the CGI T-Rex. I don't know if I've even seen all of these parts yet in the actual documentary, but let's, let's take a look to at this. To a certain extent, the more famous a VFX creature, the harder it was to put together because we knew there would be so much opinion on it. Okay. They did a pretty good job with their Tyrannosaurus for the most part. I think it's, it's every animator's dream to animate a dinosaur and animate a T-Rex. I mean T-Rex. Like, it's the scariest one because it is the most iconic one. T-Rex is a different level of scrutiny. Scientists work on it all the time. There's always new papers coming out. So we have yep. to take the best of that science and really build up a picture of what the research is telling us. Everyone 
has an idea of what T-Rex looks like in their head. We wanted to give our T-Rex that feeling of this is a top predator, this could turn it on in an instant and mm. remained truthful. So it's trying to, I guess, ground it more versus going too stylized and making it look all gnarly and scary. So different yeah. to yeah. what I would personally traditionally think of when I think of a T-Rex. When we first started off, we do a thing where we sort of do a first pass of putting body fat and muscle on it. The first version of T-Rex we got was uh, a little bit basic. <laughs> they all look... Ooh, yeah. Uh, it doesn't have enough S-curve to its neck. I guess this is probably just... It looks really stiff. I guess that's intentional when they're making a maquette like this. And thank you, Red Melian. I appreciate that. It's there. Uh, I went, I know it can't be that. It looked essentially like Rex from Toy Story. Definitely needed <laughs> to be bulkier and scarier. And sometimes it came down to just slightly pinch the skin in here. Yeah. A little bit more of an eyebrow ridge there. But the model mm -hmm. couldn't go so far into the realms of fantasy. And what we'd actually done is put too much body fat on it. We had to shrink it back down again to be <laughs> a sort of more gaunt version, if you like, and then went back to being properly scary. So there was a bit of back and forth in those early stages, but ultimately they got to the right place in the end. Nice. That looks really good there. And it's got that nice curve to its neck as well, as it should. Um, really lovely. Really lovely. I like that a lot. We're used to seeing T-Rexes running around with their teeth flashing, looking scary big monsters. The reality is most animals don't walk around with their teeth showing. A lot True. of people, I think there were three or four involved in the decisions around what T-Rex should look like, all wanted the teeth to be out. They wanted it to look really angry all the time. But, I mean, this is an ongoing kind of low-level debate among people who work on theropod dinosaurs, like, did theropod dinosaurs like T-Rex, did they have exposed teeth when their mouths were closed? Or were their teeth covered by lips, like you see in lizards? Or are they more like crocodilians, where there's no lips, the teeth are just exposed like that? Um, there seems to be a general consensus forming that they did probably have lips covering their teeth when their mouths were closed. But we're not talking about big, smoochy, kissy lips. We're talking about lips like you see on a lizard, you know? So, like... Um, what kind of lizard should we look at? Um, I don't know. Bearded dragon. Face. So yeah, like this. Lizards have lips too. They're not big, smoochy, kissy lips. but there are enough lips that you can't see their teeth when their mouths are closed, if that makes sense. Yeah, like that. Lizard lips. Yeah. Or, uh... Moto Dragon is probably a better analogy for a T-Rex, because it's also a big macro predator like that. You can't see their teeth until they open their mouths. Tyrannosaurus was probably the same way. Probably. We're not totally sure. But. Probably. And I had to sort of rein that in and say the evidence is showing that the teeth are probably covered. So ultimately these are animals and not monsters. And what we've portrayed yep. is as accurate as we can possibly make it. I Excellent. followed the fact file for T-Rex absolutely brilliantly. The way it... Lipidosaurus, there goes Steve. The beefiness of it, the way it could run, the way it has its lips, all of that stuff. Tail is too brilliant. waggly, though. The tail is too waggly there. The tail would not... The uh, yeah. way it could run, the way it has its lips. The, the... It's too wiggly waggly. They should have asked Jack Horner about this, but yeah. All of that stuff was brilliant. But one of the things we had to decide was how many feathers to put on it. And this is massively controversial. Is it feathered? 
they're not fluffy chickens. I mean, at that point, they're... Feathers weren't really feathers like modern day feathers. They're more like quills or, you know, a bit more like yeah. a sort of porcupine. Filamentous. Feathery thing. But we put them in a line down it, its back. Nice. And it, you know, it looked like a punk from 1980s London. It turned from this creature <laughs> that was dominating the forest into something that was laughable. We had to work with ILM to literally pluck the feathers out of it. So we stripped those back and it still does have the quills on the back, but they're, they're actually sort of on the crest of the male's head and down its neck and back. We ended up with an animal that looks awesome, sounds awesome, and is awesome. And I think scientists will be happy with. Yeah, happy with it. I think it did a pretty darn good job. Yeah. But yeah, anyway, that's life on our planet. I'm not getting paid to promote those or anything. I just think, I'm just really happy that it exists because it makes my life easier as somebody who talks about dinosaurs, you know, every weekday like this. The, the impression it gives of dinosaurs and of the history of life on Earth is a pretty darn good one. And so that's a positive development. And the fact that it's on Netflix of all places it has reached a huge audience and will continue to do so, and I'm really happy about that. Yeah. So yeah. And hi, Marika. How are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Uh, the Rex Pistol Snake at Dave Care. <laughs> 1980s. Punk music. London. I like it, Dave Care. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anywho. Good stuff. And with that said, it is now time to wrap up for today. So let's go ahead and do that. There's a Deinonychus skull to put our credits over, under, over, put our credits over. And now they disappeared. I'll come back. There we go. Thank you to everybody who's helped make this stream as fun as it was. I appreciate all of you. Everybody whose names are going to show up here in the credits. Followers and subscribers, cheerers and gifters, moderators and raiderators. I appreciate each and every one of you. Also, the question askers, the commenters, the emoters, and those quiet lurkers. Thank you also. I appreciate you. We're going to be doing some more paleontologizing tomorrow before the crossover stream with Belint. I'll probably start about an hour late tomorrow, just so you know. So I'm not too tuckered out by the time I do my science discussion with Belint of science streams. Um, we're going to do some scientist chat. Scientist ah scientist. But before then, everybody, you take care of yourselves. And uh, let's see who we can raid here. Who else is live on twitch.tv at this moment? Um, shoot, I should have looked for this first. Let's see. Oh, Yogurt Garrel is on. Let's go say hello to Yogurt Garrel. I think she'd appreciate that. Really spectacular. Noise, huh? Thank you, Anonymous Gifter, for gifting Nightbot there. I do appreciate that. Anonymous Gifter, I do. We're going to go see Yogurt Garrel, who is a wonderful friend of the science community here on Twitch. I was lucky enough to meet her in person at TwitchCon, and she's super cool. She is playing some Tetris with 13 viewers right now, and uh, we're going to go jump in there. So let's do it, everybody. You ready? Let's go see Yogurt Garrel. All right, take care, everybody. Till next time, bye-bye.